G'day guys, how are we all? Welcome to Warring With Words, a little special treat. Uh, if you're watching us live, this is the day or this is when we would be kind of doing CanCon, the world's largest Age Sigma event. And while I've been a little bit sad that I wouldn't be playing in this massive tournament, I am very excited to talk to a personal hero of mine, uh, an absolute legend. And I know he is not very good when it comes to being... Uh, promoted. I know he's feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now. I have done my research. I have read over 500 comments on Reddit with the AMAs. I have watched his vod, uh, Voxcast. I have read the Goonhammer article. I have been doing all my fine research to talk about Warring Wind Words with Aaron Dembski Bowden. He is the Night Lord. He is known as ADB. He has published many Black Library books. Look at him, he's so uncomfortable right now. <laughs> he's written so many Black Library books. I was introduced to ADB through the Night Lord series. My One of my very closest and dearest friends, Deke, is a massive Night Lords fan. So he's absolutely introduced me. He said, like, ADB, like, I, I could not find a bad word about you. Uh, but also, for people who don't know, ADB has written Age of Sigma Law. Uh, he's written, written the, uh, the uh, well, at least contributed to the Slaves to Darkness battle tome. Uh, and I know you are a long-term Warhammer player. So, um, g'day, welcome, hello. Can I just say that I found it immensely charming that you've said g'day like three times now, and I was totally expecting you not to do it. I'm gonna live. Up, I'm gonna live up to the character, right? Like throwing out the shrimp on the Barbie. Uh, it is, you know, Australia CanCon. We got kangaroos coming in Age of Sigma. Uh, it is a good time to be an Australian. But um, where is the beanie? I've been asked. So uh, lots of cool people in the chat. They are very excited about this. They're wondering where the beanie is. Uh, I did find a pretty cool look. To be honest with you, I thought uh, in the spirit of Australia, I thought in the spirit of this interview you might wear this hat. I thought you'd at least kind of bring up this pretty cool Aussie hat, uh, yeah, come out to the, the farm with me. Hat. Yeah, it was, um, it's, it's... Yeah, what was the story with this hat? Well, I wanted to try it on because I'm like, I look good in hats. And then one of the editors now has photographic evidence that I, I don't look good in all hats at all. Like, <laughs> it was quite disappointing, but it is what it is. So g'day, everyone is is super pumped. I'm getting a lot of cool people, you know, saying, you know, you're, Chris is saying you're a personal hero. Hello. Uh, first time hearing your voice. So uh, if you wanted to hear his voice as well, did a pretty awesome interview with Wade uh, on the Voxcast about 12 months ago. And I think you also did a video on the Siege of Terror. So um, glad that you joined me. And we are talking war on words or warring on words. So this is not going to be a specific conversation to any particular book. But I reached out to ADB because I'm, well, there's a couple of reasons. First off, one, obviously, other than being an amazing human and very interesting person, I'm a you know, big fan on, on the books as well as on Twitter and, and just seeing what he contributes onto the community. But two, uh, I remember seeing a whole bunch of things, you know, Black Library put out uh, a call for authors, whether it's in horror, whether it is for um, new authors to join their committee. Um, and I know talking to my Discord, there is a lot of aspiring writers, people who are either wanting to turn writing into a career, whether it's with Black Library or not with Black Library. I know the world has changed a lot. You know, you can be a published author. There are more gaming uh, companies than ever before. There's Kickstarters, there's Patreon, there's so many things to become a professional author. But at the same time, I'm also seeing a lot of people getting more invested in the law, more people writing fan fiction, more people writing up characters and uh, really wanting to tell their story other than just what the dice roll on the table. And I, 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 I wanted to kind of explore this topic and I wanted someone who really walked that path because I know ADB you write down in your book, you write down wins and losses. I know you are uh, obviously do amazing work when it comes to character development. I thought we could explore this topic. Uh, if that sounds good with you, if not, this is a really awkward couple of hours. We're just going to sit here and <laughs> disagree with the, the topic. Oh, I'm, I'm at your, I'm at your service. Hit me with whatever. So I'm going to ask a couple of rapid fire questions just to get like for anyone who hasn't heard you 
speak in an interview. They haven't read any of the articles. Um, who doesn't know who you are? Um, should that should there be one person in the world? So you got into Warhammer through Warhammer Quest. You got through Warhammer through uh, friends. Um, I know you're a long term fantasy player. Uh, I know that you are. Uh, I love your Necromunda, but you don't like my gang. I'm a Van Sar man, and I'm a, I was a bit concerned when I read that you were a like, really cordial player, but you didn't like Van Sar. And I liked Van Sar because it reminded me of uh, a wrestler back in the day called Steve Blackman. Um, so that was how I got into Van Sar back in the 90s. <laughs> okay, well, you came to them honestly, which is at least that's a plus. But, like, in every group, it's not so bad in the new edition. But you remember, like, way back in the mists of time with the original Necromunda? Everyone who played Van Sar was just, they, they, they won and they had to do the least to achieve that victory. They could stand and shoot every match because, and they just did it perfectly. All their skill ups were useful. And anyway, the guy who was that in my group was called Mark. And he was just, I, I never beat him. It, not just because I sucked. I do, I do suck at Necromunda, but also just because he was just, he was Van Sar. He was never anything but Van Sar. So that's bitter memories of that guy. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to be that guy. I just I just watched a, a, a little video, a 40k video about being that guy. I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> I like being Van Sar. I like Steve Blackman. But uh, but w one thing we do share in common is a love for Gorka Morka. And thank you so much mm -hmm. on Warhammer Community calling out Wade saying that you've wanted Gorka Morka back. That is <laughs> probably the greatest Warhammer game they ever produced from Specialist. Um, Certainly on par with Mordheim. Um, mm. I loved Gorka Morka. That was just like some of the greatest fun I ever had as a kid. I was terrible at that too, but God, I, I loved that game so much. So many long <laughs> Sundays spent hiding from the sunshine, <laughs> trapped inside playing Gorka Morka. Uh, and I'll never forget the this one particular game I had with a friend where it was like you're you're racing, so the map just continued to move, and uh, if oh. your cars kind of bumped into each other, uh, you could like knock people off, and they would fall and essentially fall off the map. I just, um, anyone who, who who doesn't know what Gorka Morka is, it was a game. Basically, it's it was what Speed Freaks has been. Gork, Speed Freaks is kind of replacing Gorka Morka, but maybe like the ten percent of what it was. Mm, um yeah yeah now it's it's not the same level but some rapid fire questions to get to know adb before we start and none of these questions adb knows are coming so uh what's your favorite song oh laid by james favorite food or dish um chicken korma very mild because i am a wuss fair enough fair enough it's hard to, yeah it's, it's it's once you get a good indian dish um yeah, I like mild, spicy though. food, but not spicy Indian food. I have no idea why. It's always like when, when I go to like a Thai restaurant and they, and I ask them, they're like, oh, do you like hot? And I'm like, is it white person hot or is it <laughs> Asian hot? And I'm not being racist. It's just the tolerance level. It's like what they think is hot is just explosive to me. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Oh, that changes every every week. Um, it's, it, it's probably Ravenous which is a very little known uh, horror movie set just after the American Civil War, uh, sorry, the uh, American War with Mexico. But it changes every, every bit. It, yeah, it always goes back to Ravenous. Fair enough. I, w I would have said Night at the Roxbury, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same idiot that watches Ball Rat like at least once every six months, uh, which, which people who watch this channel would know that I, I do bust out my Venas or... I try to bring out my Bora uh, every so often. And for anyone who hasn't had an interview or hasn't seen your interviews or haven't actually caught anything, um, I, I will high level ask you the question, how did you first get into the hobby and how did you first get into writing? The hobby was, um, I, I always give this like totally generic answer, but that's because it's true. Like everyone who is roughly 40 in England who's into the hobby got in it through Space Crusade and Hero Quest. Um, which were like the kind of licensed Milton Bradley slash Games Workshop games. And they I, was were, exactly the, I was exactly the same, exactly the same. It was a yeah. it was a, a rainy night at a friend's house. They busted out uh, Warhammer Quest or maybe Heroes Quest uh, yeah. fighting against that amazing bloodthirsty gargoyle. <laughs> gargoyle. 
Yeah, yeah like, it's just like, but hey, man, that's, that's where the Chaos Warrior was born, which made the yeah. Space Marine, which made the Stormcast Eternal, that humble little Chaos Warrior. Good times. I love that. Like, I always play, who, you, who did you play as? I was always the Barbarian. I thought it was the Dwarf. Yeah. How, not, there's, that's no choice. If there's a Dwarf, I'm going to be the Dwarf. I always wanted the Barbarian because I think I got three dice, three attack he, dice instead of two. He did have three attack dice. He was a beast. Yeah, but that, that's, that's still how I play Dungeons and Dragons. I'm just like, yeah, give me the Barbarian. Let me max out my strength. I'll be the Goliath. I'm just going to run in and I just want to swing stuff. Uh, other people can do the, the role playing stuff. Let me just get into combat. Oh, for shame. <laughs> and, and from a writing perspective, I know you started writing. Um, and you, you first started writing when you were uh, writing for some friends, and then you got your your I guess your your first break um, writing in RPGs. And I know you did a little bit of work yeah. with Vampire the Masquerade, um, and you did some video game work. Uh, yeah, I bounced around between RPGs and like a little bit of video games for a while. That was like in my as soon as I left uni, I did a writing degree, and then I went kind of straight into the RPG industry, which is really lucky because that's quite a small industry. And finding full-time employment in that is like as, as rare as hen's teeth, as my daddy would say. And uh, um, I was, it's not, I wasn't like a millionaire, I take it be wrong, but I was like, just, I could just afford to make that my only job, <laughs> which, uh, which I did that for a few years. That was, that was great. But obviously I always wanted to be a novelist and I got um, the Black Library man man blah, 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 managing editors uh, email off Mike Lee, who I worked with on RPGs before, um, and he said, "Yeah, I yeah, just email away and see if they need anything." And back then, you had to do like an Imperial Guard novel to prove that you could, I don't know, spell. Uh, so I, I, I did Cadian Blood, and then that came back, and they loved that. So that was when I was like, "Can I write about Space Marines, please?" And that was. And from there, it's it's all it's all history. And it's interesting because that was when you set the trend of, of submitting books late. Um, and, it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to call you out. You said that you've always wanted to be a writer, and maybe you've maybe you've 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 changed your tune. But I know at one point in time you wanted to be a paramedic. I so did, yeah, but I'm too dumb. So <laughs> it was just not not really on the cards. I don't know, I don't know, it's a bit rough. <laughs> It's people's <laughs> lives, man. You can't, you can't half-ass that. That's true. That is very true. Uh, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I always thought that I'd be good uh, getting up on, you know, in front of uh, objection, Your Honor, and, you know, very much like the American uh, television shows. I thought I'd be really, really good, you know, and I've got a history in, like, working with sales and sales and marketing teams. Uh, and, it, and then I realized in Australia, it has nothing to do like the Americans. That it's always like just according to chapter seven of the blah, blah, versus blah case. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's not for me. Uh, so it's funny oh, how we sad story. I know, I know. I'm like, man, I'd be awesome up on stage. Like, you know, there's a massive, compelling sales story. Uh, speaking of stories, though, I know that you Smooth. said in 2013 that you wanted to write a love story. Did you ever get a chance to write that love story? <laughs> no. <Aww. laughs> um, actually, okay. It's, it's entirely my fault. It's not that they won't let me. Uh, in fact, at one point, this would have been 2017, I think it would have been, or 2018. Um, what was I writing? I was writing Master of Mankind. And I got an email from, uh, this is the, the, the new ma managing editor. And it was, I, th I think, oh, we'll get into the concept of eras at Black Library later on, probably. But like, there had just been another big era change. And they said, hey, remember that uh, Dark Eldar love story you wanted to do? You could totally do that right now if you want it. And I was like, up to my throat in the Master of Mankind. Um, and I knew after that, I think I had like Black Legion coming next. I was like, there's just, I can't even think about anything else right now. I was, I was just up to my up to my eyeballs and the settings guts and the metaphysics. And I was like, I'll, I'll deal with this later, but I later hasn't really come. Cause no, I don't know. I just, I kind of worry that no one would give a shit and everyone would laugh at me for doing it or something, but I think it'd be great. Like a dark Eldar love story. I think it would be boss. 
It's been a long time since I've seen a good quality love story. I think uh, obviously in Warhammer Fantasy, we had Vlad and Isabella. And to me, that was kind of like the last good love story that we've kind yeah. of seen. And people are still talking about Isabella and Vlad to this day. I know when Nighthawk were coming out and we heard like the voices of, of what we now know as um, Alinda, people thought it might be um, Isabella or the ghost of Isabella or, you know, uh, a, a waning Isabella coming back looking for Vlad. And I know that was a big speculation. So clearly the love stories still have their place. Um, we're just waiting for that, that story. Mm. <laughs> I'm just, I was just looking up because I've, I've got a post it up there which, with my schedule and I was like, no. <laughs> uh, I'll bring this one up as a, if you put your name on a book, we will buy it. Uh, nice. <laughs> well, if you want to buy something of ADBs, there is a link below to. Um, oh my god! No, no, no! To your to your web comic. I know you've got a very cool web comic as well. Um, so go check that out. Um, I'll, I'll give you some shouts. Um, people, people don't like. This. Well, I, I reckon you're one of the few. I love a good love story. Give me a good love story. Uh, give me, give me instead of Fabio on the cover, give me Sigvold on the cover, like a romance novel. Um, I don't that know if you make heard. bank. Well, I, I, like I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Games Workshop lean into Sigvold like Fabio, because for most people, uh, at least the younger generation, they miss the whole Fabio craze. Fabio, yeah. the most beautiful man in the world. Uh, on every cover of a romance novel in like Days of the Restless. Uh, I know him because of Australia. There was a actor called Short Michaela who, um, who would act up um, like Fabio and it was like a skit show. Like you know, it was, it was very, very funny, but uh, that's not what you're here to talk about. I want to know more about you and then we'll get into, um, into can we buy ADB braided beanies, branded beanies. All right. When do we, when do we get, when do we get beanies? Oh, I don't, the thing is, right, I lose, on average, I lose one a year. And the site where I used to get them from now is, is, is bust. I, somehow my mass beanie spendage wasn't enough to keep them afloat. And so I'm down to one. And, and it, luckily, it's my favorite one. But I just, I'm worried about just wearing it out because then, then what am I going to do? And I keep buying new ones all the time and they're not right. They're not the right size, not the right shape. Anyway, this is an extremely boring but super no, important to me. No, thing. We, love, we, love, we love beanies. I think I think we're seeing that people want the ADB beanie. It's just like ADB, bitch, uh, I reckon. Uh, one other thing, though, I actually know two more questions I'd like to get to know ADB before we get into, like, the meats and potato of the, of the show is um, I know you've talked previously about doing your hobby half hour at the Aaron Orium. Um the Aaron Orium is your your mecca. Uh, I know you've got a pretty cool gaming space, and, and what we're seeing in the background is just like the hallway or the waiting room into the Aaron Orium. But um, are you still doing your hobby half hour? Am I bollocks? Um, Christmas killed that, and well, to be honest, I'm 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 writing my Siege of Terror novel right now. So I wake up, I write, I sleep. And then I wake up and I write and I sleep. I'm doing, uh, I got some paint on, on a couple of Space Marines like th this week. And it's the first time I've had paint on plastic in five months. Like it's, I've just, I've been so busy. I will say that you are an amazing painter. Um, shout out to yourself. I'll show you just a couple little bit of uh, your hobby. Like this is, this is extraordinary. This is yours, right? Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I cheat, right? Because I'm very neat. I'm not. I'm not good. Like I can't wet blend. I can't. I, I have no like tricks or tactics. I'm just very, very neat. And neatness can like cover a lot of sins. Yeah, this is extraordinary. I I, I, I took a second glance. Not that I didn't think that you could paint, but I'm like, man, this is really good stuff. Is this just some stock? I stole these images off Goonhammer. Uh, an interview you did about six months ago, and I'm like, oh, maybe they just because they they often don't put up their own models. They'll put up. Yeah. Uh, someone from Instagram. I thought, oh, maybe they've pulled some, you know, I know you are a, a, an Ivan the Dipkin player. So I thought, oh, maybe they just pull up some really good hobby. But no, it's yours. I couldn't find any credit. So I, I, I thought it must be yours. It's totally mine. 
Uh, people are super keen. For, by the way, people are just like, shout out how amazing you are and uh, how you've inspired so many people. So um, big love there. And also, more importantly, they're saying that Warhammer Romance is the next big thing, right? You know, we've got sure. Warhammer Horror. Um, we've had Warhammer Horror. We've we've done Warhammer Comedy. Let's do Warhammer Romance. So um, people are very excited about buying your limited edition Siege stories and like just people are just being very, very awesome. So I'm very great, grateful that you took the time out to chat with me. The last question, cool. the last question before we get into like the, the story uh -huh. is I know you're a terrain man and I know you like painting terrain. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that still, is that still true? Kind of. I mean, yes, it's true. I, 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 but the thing is like, I've got such a terrain backlog now that just looking at it makes me anxious. So I'm like, I can't even, that's my game rooms just there through that arch. And I just, I just looking in there, the amount of sector mechanicus terrain I've got and the amount of Azerite ruins. I was like, no, I just, I, I can't even look in there right now. It's so intimidating. <laughs> I just, uh, the, the board has to look perfect, you know? Like if you look in the, the background of my Idenest photos, uh, the back, the, the, the terrain and stuff and the board, they look like almost Games Workshop studio quality, which is a very, uh again it's a cheat because one of it is my friend ross's excellent photography and uh, the second one is that ross mostly and also me we just spend ages on the terrain because we want the boards to look brilliant but then of course that means we don't well he does but i don't then get my armies done very very fast so there's a balance there is definitely a balance, especially when you're a family man and you have so many books with so many deadlines to do. Uh, and also big, big love to Night Lord here um, saying that we should create a Discord for all the fan writers inspired by ADB. I think it would be <laughs> one of the biggest Discords going around. Uh, I thought my Discord was big. I reckon that one would just be even bigger. <laughs> I, sn I snuck into yours the other day, actually. Oh, did you? I did. And I was, like, oh. looking around. And looking to see if there's any deepkin photos that I could steal inspiration from. What, look, look, waiting to see if people are shit talking you. Uh, oh God, no! I, I've I've learned not to ever search my name. I don't look at Reddit for that exact reason. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to get Reddit. I don't know what they say about me. Yeah. Um, like, I'm sure they I'm sure that it's all very lovely and positive. But I don't want to. I don't want to find that one person who hates my guts and is the That's person. Exactly who's it, down right? There's like there's always one person that downvotes every single video that I do. Like even before it goes up, there's always like just one, just one, maybe two. So I must have a mortal enemy, and maybe he's on Reddit <laughs> or her. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so talk to me about Warhammer, and you know, you've obviously been in the hobby for a long time. I know, you know, you said that you know you always played the dwarf in Warhammer Quest. Uh, I believe you were an elf player back in the day. Um, is that is, is my research correct? It is. It is. Uh, and um, even Undead, were you an Undead player? Briefly. No, and it was not a successful one. Do you remember how uh, Warhammer Army's Undead used to used to function? You know, when you'd lose your characters. Yeah, and I would always, always lose my characters. Um, the, yeah, the thing is, I, I tend to not... I have this weird thing, which I brought up with my therapist once or twice, that like, I, some, I don't often play my favorite things. And the same thing is I don't write what I play and I often don't write about my favorite things. And I don't really know what that is, um, but it's just been like this lifelong habit. So I, I don't, I have no particular love for elves, right? But I, dwarves have always been my fantasy race of choice, but I played like 4,000 points of high elves and a thousand points of wood elves. And I've never painted a dwarf in my life and I've never owned a full dwarf army. I painted one to Arden once they, uh, you know, got the trademark name change. Um, the the Endrin Master was just such a great model, and I was like, oh yeah, I've got to paint him. And then the moment he was done, I was like, I despise this color scheme, and I'm never going to touch him again. So farewell. We'll get you on the Dwarf Army eventually, uh, bring day. you over to cities. But I, I do remember like reading a lot of your um, some of your interviews and even just some of your spots on AMA. Uh, by the way, your AMA on Reddit went for what over ten hours. So I was, I remember looking at the log like it started at like eight or nine o'clock and it finished at over four four a.m. So, um, and I was just like over five hundred questions, which was just remarkable learning about you. So I kind of know some of these answers, but 
getting into the Warhammer world a little bit, and I know we've got a mixed group here of 40K players, Heresy players, Sigma players, uh, Fantasy players, so maybe we, we won't go too deep, but maybe being an Age of Sigma channel, I will have to ask you a couple of questions. What is your What are your Age of Sigma and your 40K armies? And that extends to 30K as well. Um, so do you, which armies do you collect? I don't play 40K, and I don't play Heresy either. Um, I do play Age of Sigma. That's like that's probably my, uh, Necromunda and Age of Sigma are our two main games here. I've al I've always been more of a fantasy player. Um, so I've got my Deepkin, and I have just so much backlogged plastic of stuff that I think, yeah, this is the army that I'll do, and then I just I, I never get to them, which is not different from anyone. Don't get me wrong, but even when I do an army, I do it so incredibly slowly. Uh, so. Yeah, I've got my Deepkin, and I promise myself I'm going to have a Gloomspite Gets army, which well, I desperately want them. They just look so much fun. They are uh, a lot of they are a lot of fun, and it's interesting you mention that because most of your Black Library catalog is 40k, yet you claim to not oh, play yeah. 40k, and mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of. And a lot of people smashed me. The minute I put out this, you know, like I'm asking for questions, I think the big overwhelming question from my community was when are you going to write some some Age of Sigma books? <laughs> yeah, it's it's your primary game. And I guess this is the balance, right? And I guess this is where, you know, just because the thing that you love to do doesn't always make the big business and commercial sense and the challenge of, I guess, or maybe the freedom of writing about 40K without being tied to the game so I guess that's going to impact like when we get into like the story writing and character development, I'm sure there's some interesting correlation because yeah. I would have imagined if I was a 40K writer, I would only play 40K because that's the world that I immersed myself into. But yet it could be, the game could be, I guess, a, an escape from the world. I, I don't know. What's the relationship to you? That's a, Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, think, I think in some ways that's really difficult for some fans to get because... They sort of see it through the lens of, say you're a Space Wolf player and you really love the Space Wolves, obviously you'd want to write about the Space Wolves. I'm kind of the opposite. Like, if I spend 15 hours a day thinking about something and then and then all my conversations with all my friends are about the thing, you know, like, because we're talking about the lore and stories and all that stuff anyway, and half the stuff I read is going to be about the thing, then I don't, I don't really want to play the thing as well. And also, it like... I, one of the things I've always tried to avoid is like I'm not biased because I love everything. I don't love anything more than anything else, really. Um, and I've, I've always kind of liked that I uh, like I'm not I'm not the I know I get like the chaos guy, but I don't like chaos any more than I like anything else. You know, if I was going to play 40k, if I had my dream 40k army, it would be Tyranids. What? Why Tyranids? I just I love it. they are the perfect combination, right? Of awesome models awesome law you know they're like the models are just they look like nothing else and then the law is like just sinister and just complex enough to kind of engage with and i love the idea that like you'd have a whole army right where every unit and sometimes every character is effectively they they themselves don't know what they are right they're not characterized but so it's characterized by the the armies facing them so you'd say you'd have like a, a, a regiment of Tyranid warriors, right? Then they would be like, they'd have like a cool Eldar name because the Eldar would know them as X from the Battle of Y. And then uh, like you'd have a Hive Tyrant that the Imperium knew as A from the Battle of B. I just, I find that just so cool. Like, cause that's just, um, that does so much narrative like legwork, like just just really just by the concept itself. And I, I love that shit. I think that's, that's such a cool way to define your army. And plus I just love the models. I, I have flashbacks of Tyranids when I was playing. Um, so I got into 40K in second edition because mm -hmm. um, my games club was mostly a 40K club. Um, there was pro the, the fantasy community was only a small growing one. 40K was the hotness. I remember working with my friend Stu, uh, gluing down, you know, metal carnifexes and, and metal <laughs> uh, hormigaunts and, you know, back in the day when I was like 10 or 12, I didn't know how to pin. Uh, I just used an industrial amount of super glue. So I just have nightmares of that Carnifex, that four oh, yeah. heavy clawed Carnifex. It would break all the time. And I never remember seeing the, was it, what's the big ship? The Thunder, 
the Thunderhawk. I remember seeing that in the Games World magazine. I'm like, man, how much plastic glue would I, how much super glue would I need to glue that metal Thunderhawk together? And that's, a, as a kid, how I saw the world. It's weird, because do you remember how heavy that thing was? I never I never got to play it in real life, because, like, it was a million dollars as a kid. Yeah. It was like, like, I was buying my army blister, blister pack at a time, like $15 blister pack to get three Empire Archers. Yeah. The good old uh, days. Oh, the good old days. So like people are like, oh, Games Workshop was so expensive. I'm like, imagine you trying to build out your horde for fifteen to twenty dollars at a time for three <laughs> models, like three models. Uh, but I do have to call out Alex's comment here, saying that you only write heresy to kill uh, Logar repeatedly. So, uh, oh, I did. I did try and kill him. Like I was really happy with this arc, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and kill him. And it was the rare sort of uh, instance of. Games Workshop saying no, and I knew they would say no to be honest because, I, well, my guess, and this is just a guess, uh, would be that it's a Chaos Primarch who could come back one day with a giant, expensive, beautifully sculpted, detailed model. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they're not um, eager to have him offed in a, in a prequel, so to speak. Are you a D and D player? Marty's asking, are you a D and D player? And if so, are you a player or a DM? Because I know you've got a history with RPGs. Mm. No, I uh, I do play D and D. I normally play uh, World of Darkness games like Werewolf or, or Vampire and more. But I, I love D and D. Uh, I run World of Darkness games more than I run D and D. But I used to run D and D about like seventy percent of the times for my groups as well. Yeah. Yeah, great. And Night Lord, uh, I will definitely, we will get to that around character development. Absolutely. A uh, couple of other quick questions, Age of Sigmar ones. Um, do you have a favorite god in the mortal realms? Oh, God, I wish I'd, I wish I'd looked at these questions in detail before. So, so I prepared. I'm sure it's a dwarf one, right? Grimnir. No, actually, I, it's probably Malarian. Ooh. Um, because, and again, this is, I'm not saying, a lot, of, a lot of the stuff that I like doesn't necessarily coincide with what GW will do or will probably do. That doesn't mean I'm saying what they'll do sucks. It just means that my preferences run towards A and B instead of X and Y. But if, I think you remember that image they released of Malarian fairly early on with the dragon wings. Yeah, it's like this. It's just this fucking insane serpent monster thing with those huge dragon wings, just like that massive claw. And then the lore of him is like he's just hiding out in the realm of shadows, just hating, you know, just seething with this hate. And I just, I love the idea of this god who has just run off to this like misty, murky, secret realm and just hating. And I love the idea of that so much, not necessarily because of that in itself is a strong concept, because that's, that's not like super original or anything. But all the cultures and all the civilizations, and all the settlements that you know live up in this that rise up with that as their god and like what different ways do they interpret that uh what does it mean to like have this god up on a mountain above your capital city that just that just hates that just radiates this like secretive malice all the time like i just that kind of stuff like fascinates me like the ground level of the realms that's what i love and so yeah. in terms of Malarian, like just the cultures that would spring up around that, that's, that's awesome. I love that stuff. I've, uh, I've been recently getting into the Dark Elf lore. So my army's on parade this year, so 2021. I've dedicated to be a, um, uh, a Dark Elf army, well, essentially Daughters of Cain. Uh, and you may appreciate this. I'm actually going to tap into the Cult of Pleasure, the old 6th edition that oh, got yeah. retconned into 7th edition Cult of Pleasure, a.k.a. the Cult of, of Slanesh. And I've been reading a lot about Malekith, now Malarian, and the, the relationship Marathi and High Elves. And because I was an Empire player, I couldn't care less about Fancy Pants Elves. You guys were in the old, you guys were in the new world. I was in the old world. I was more worried about, you know, Chaos and Norska and the Fancy Pants Bretonians. Um, but... And I imagine, like, when we get to the end, I want to ask you, you know, some of the things, you know, what do you, what would you like to write in the future? Uh, and as an Age of Sigmar player, I would love your take on Malekith, now Malarian, given that there's not a lot of things written yet. Um, 
and you know it's a bit of an open space you know marathi's just turned into a god um you know she has you know been reimagined um through through you know her elves but what does that malarian version look like and with your history i'd love to hear your thoughts um, do you have a favorite character in Age of Sigma and in 40k slash 30k? And if so, who are they? Um, I've got to say, in Age of Sigma, it would probably be either Malarian or Marathi again, because I think um, I really like. I just I, I love what they've how they've been reincarnated, so to speak. I'm not. I'm being told. I'm being told. Sly Marbo is the only true god. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if that's your your favorite character in in 40k, but <laughs> Sly Marbo is pretty sweet. He's um, it's too much flesh for me to paint. You know, I don't like skin. Just like armor that I can carefully ink. That's that's what I need. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, my my cat's called Loken because of uh, Horus Rising um back for like long before i got into writing for black library when i got that book but i don't know a favorite characters are, are difficult probably sigismund is probably my favorite 40k character uh and yeah a aos is, is is different because there's such a disparity between like the characters we see all the time up here on the level of gods and there aren't that many like groundlings so to speak um, yeah, so I'd say Malarian and Marathi for AOS, and probably Sigismund for. But yeah, so this is I'm always going to get this with favorite questions, right? Because I don't, I don't really have favorites. Um, I just because I, I've been into the stuff since I was eight, you know. So I love everything. There's nothing. There's nothing I don't like. And well, it tends to happen is I'll just change my mind from month to month as something clicks and inspires me, and that'll fade away, and I'll inevitably not finish painting it. And then yeah. it'll be something else. Oh, look, you asked me 12 months ago, I would have said Scragrot, the Loon King, you know, the, the, the famous goblin who reads the bad moon. He's got yeah. his Loon Asylum. You know, it's just absolutely like his lore is bonkers. Yeah. Then reading like the sons of Behemoth, the Gargan army and the way they they tell their stories. And like that's got me now that I'm knee deep in Marathi and like this, I, I'm literally uh, I might even send Marathi a, a Valentine's Day card. I'm just absolutely obsessed with this amazing actually last night i was reading the realms of chaos slaves to darkness book from second edition like i was yeah. literally reading about like the old slan and i was looking at you know what they said about slanish back, back in the 80s uh or early 90s and it's just like it's just remarkable so I, yeah I, I fully appreciate that our favorites change so much yeah. uh but probably like music i've got like a top five that i you know they're, they're my top five they might rotate from from time to time but my top five rock bands are my top five mm -hmm. um what's what is do you do you realize you made many people love a bad and right <laughs> that's i mean i hope that's true uh i have this kind of unhealthy approach to just deciding what i want to write sometimes where I'll go, hey, everyone gets this wrong, <laughs> so I'll, I'll take the case, you know, and that's like that's super unhealthy, and it's, I, w I worry that it's arrogant. I mean, I, I don't mean it from an arrogant place. What I mean is just you see people. Okay, when you're behind the curtain, right? You just you're, you're always having these conversations about what how X should be presented or how it wasn't necessarily presented perfectly in the past, or you know, your ideas of how it should be presented. And just one of the things was always like, it often mystified people um, at Games Workshop, why Avadon was a joke. Because a lot of people didn't, they don't, they didn't see the memes so much. Like Avadon being a joke is a meme thing. It's not, it's not in the law. The law is always like, yeah, he's prophesized to end the Imperium. He is the arch traitor. He's the one who all the seers predict will succeed where Horus failed. Now, obviously, as customers of a company, we know that that, that that can't happen because you can't, you know, you can't end 40k. And plus, the way Chaos has its claws into Abaddon, it will never let him win. But he's the one that the Imperium, you know, is absolutely certain will. He's like, he's the, he's the name that parents whisper to their kids, you know, he's the devil, he's the Antichrist of the center. So I was like, I'd like to convey that but I don't want to play it straight, but I, I read a lot of historical fiction. And what I do is 
I try and write in, from that perspective. A lot of historical fiction isn't from the perspective of the like the, the famous person. It's people in there in a circle, um, the people who are there on the fringes who like uh, experience the events set in motion by that person. So that's why in the Black Legion, like I, I wanted to in the Black Legion series, I wanted to have characters in a bad sphere and their lives are defined by his actions and the things he sets in motion. But you don't really get to see inside a Baden's head because I don't, I don't think you should really. No, I don't think so. Especially like some of the things I don't want to learn. Uh, people, people are, are, are questioning your favorite character choice, thinking it should be Sevatar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you just wouldn't Sevatar. get away with a live stream without Sevatar being brought up at least once. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, Sevatar is everything I hate in a character, I think, to be honest. Everything I hate in a character. Um, and it was, he's, he's kind of like me, me and John French used to talk about this, like combining all the stuff I don't like in genre characters. And I want to. I want to redeem him and I want to make him credible and convincing. And so that's why I've like leaned into, like I've researched quite a lot about sociopathy, psychopathy, and like heavy levels of autism to convey like what, what it's like to be around Sevatar and what it's like to be, you know, in his, in his, in his mind sometimes, but often like the best Sevatar scenes, I think are when someone's near him and not entirely sure how to react to him. Uh, there's a, a line that I was really happy with, which I think sums up Sevatar really well, which says, he's, like, he's, he, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but it's like, at some point in the conversation with Araman, he smiles because that's what you're supposed to do at that point in the conversation. He has no idea how to interact, like, interact with people, but he, he just like copies other people. And, you know, and so, yeah, he's a lot of that. Like, he's like the, the badass, the wisecracker. He's all of that stuff, which I kind of hate. But I was like, how do I make this credible? How do I make this a character that I care about and that I can make other people care about? That was That's the idea with Sevatai. And he's got a long arc, and we kind of haven't really seen that much of it. I love that. And I, I and we are dancing, and it's, it's perfect, because I wanted to segue into character development. But I did want to call out this quick question, which was, um, uh, Antarian is becoming a father this year. Congratulations. Right. Um, w when and how can I introduce the fluff to my son, and where should I get started? Um, I, I think I think first off, you know, kids, um, they, they say, you know, in, in classic kids books that you should uh, play Beethoven and, you know, classical music when they're in the womb. I imagine 40K law, maybe Night Lords, audio dramas um, have that while the baby's in the womb and then, you know, uh, you know, puts them to, to sleep. And uh, I, I would imagine that would be a wonderful start to the kid's life. I don't know if you have any thoughts, but in fairness, I don't have any kids. I've got a dog, so uh, maybe I'm That's not going to take caring advice from, but you've got some. Um, I wouldn't try to get them into it. It's one of those things where I think if they're going to get into it, then they will. Um, like my son hasn't shown that much interest my son shakes he's nine now or he's gonna be nine in a few weeks he hasn't shown that much interest in it but my daughter scout she's five and every like week i'll get several questions of hey daddy can we paint warhammer i'm like wait till i get you some spare sprues that you can mess up my beloved my beloved daughter uh so i think it, it they'll just gravitate to it if, if they're going to um that said i read the first two uh warhammer AOS uh, kids books. I read them to Shakes like when he was uh, seven or eight, seven, I think. Um, and he loved those. He absolutely loved those. And I was, to be honest, I was one of the people who was like, I didn't want to say it in public, you know, because if there's something that GW do that I don't like, I just won't talk about it. But then, like, I thought about it like for a few days and I was like, you know what? Screw it. I, I trust, you know, I trust the two, the Tom Middleston and, uh, Kevin Scott. I was like, you know what? They're, they're, they're good writers. I trust them. Let's see how it goes. Um, and then I saw the artwork and I, the artwork just reminded me of all these cartoons I loved when I was a kid. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm on board now. And that was when I did a tweet thread defending it. So I was like, actually, you know what? I think this is going to kick ass. And I read those first two books. You know, it's about the Skaven um, in the in the, the city in Gyron. And yeah, Shakes loved it. And I was surprised. Like, there's some it's not like gory or anything, but there's some like not there's some pretty horrible stuff. Like 
chapter one is you know the the kid running away from her dying mother in a slave camp and it's like it's not it's not it's warhammer it's Warhammer for a kid story as well like with yeah, yeah 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 under context here it's not uh for adults this is adults mm. telling children or children reading on their own yeah. um which is which is remarkable but again like uh, I, I imagine, I, I think the people who are in the hobby today sometimes forget how lucky they are. You know, you and I grew up in an age where we learnt to paint with a book called How to Paint Citadel Miniatures, where there was no video demonstrations, where terrain was cardboard cutouts or you would use styrofoam or we'd get like encyclopedias and, and clag glue and um, yeah. like... The, the world has just expanded significantly. And even from a, from a law perspective, um, I would read like the old Gotrex and Felix books, but from a law perspective, there just wasn't a lot. But now yeah. you've got people uh, who are doing Patreon. Like, you know, I subscribe to Gab Thorpe's Patreon and get all his thoughts and his ideas. And yeah, yeah. I've got people doing, you know, comic books like yourself. I can learn so much more from fan fiction and video interviews. It's just crazy. Um, and I know there was a question that came up a little bit earlier, which was kind of similar to where I wanted to segue. Um, it came from Brian. And it's kind of where I wanted to segue into from a character development. So we kind of got a little bit of an idea of who you are and what got you into the world and um, some of the, you know, like just uh, get a better understanding as you because I guess the way you've grown up and the way you perceive the hobby will be different to so many people who have written in the past or will be writing for Black Library uh, in the future. But from a character development point of view, because um, as a player, I want to have better characters and I'd love to have my characters fleshed out a bit more. I feel like in one fantasy where I could customize my armies a bit more yeah. with, you know, very niche decisions, I had stronger characters. Um, though I shouldn't let you know, rules dictate characters. Mm. But I think for me, at least as a minimum, while I'm, I'm not an aspiring writer, I would like to be able to tell better stories. But then there's also people who are aspiring writers. So I guess the question that I had that came up uh, a couple of times, and Brian just asked it here, is like from a narrative perspective, um, does Games Workshop or even, you know, I know you wrote for Vampire the Masquerade and you've done other things, but how does the major developments go into the briefing of a project? Do you, do you pitch an idea to them like, hey, I want to write a love story about the Dukari, or do they tell you what to do? Like, hey, we need the seven hundred uh, sto uh, Stormcast um, Space Marine uh, book. Uh, is it a bit of a mixture? Like, how how does the process start for you? Okay, this is probably going to be a long and a long and branching answer, <clears throat> and it may not be satisfying at times because the reality is that it's very complicated. Um, you need to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Every single project is different. So that's one. Every single novel comes into existence differently. That's one thing to bear in mind. Then secondly, every single author has a different relationship with editorial. Then um, Games Workshop goes through eras, you know, like this, one of the things that we kind of joke about is that, you know, when people say, oh, Games Workshop, it just did xyz games workshop doesn't exist <laughs> like there is no one gestalt whole you know like what games workshop is is a bunch of departments that communicate often very well um like any company you know uh but when in terms of the law the point that the fr freedom of interpretation is often the point it's often you're not supposed to be beholden to something that someone wrote uh you know, 25 years ago on the lunch break in one paragraph, you know, the point is that we often have this thing where we say 40 K doesn't exist. There's like, there's no one thing that we all see. Um, actually it was the previous, literally the previous IP manager who explained this to me. He was like, imagine there's like a giant sphere and there are like a million windows on this sphere and everyone can look into the different windows and they see, something in there they see different parts of it it's like effectively like the the, you know, the three blind men and the elephant you know it's, it's that kind of thing and games workshop is often often the same kind of thing so there are some authors just to wrap this get this back on track there are some authors who go uh who almost exclusively have their stuff uh that they get approached they'll be like 
uh, they'll get emails from the editors saying, hey, we'd like a story about this. We'd like a book about this. Could you do that? And then like 80% of the stuff they do will be that. They'll like, the, uh, the, the uh, minis are coming out X, Y, and Z. We'd like a, a novel about this character to tie into those minis. And I think um, I think I read in your AMA there was something about a Dreadnought. There was a book that you were putting out, and I think there was a re-release or some type of Dreadnought release. Oh, that was Dreadnought. The Dread yeah. Knight. Sorry, I thought it was Dreadnought. Yeah, yeah Dread Knight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my, my editor asked me to put a Dread Knight in the Emperor's Gift, uh, and I, I was just like, I, I I didn't want to do it just for the sake of it, and I was so far into the book by that point, I was like, I just, you know, no. But but occasionally, like there'll be. But you can get little requests like that once in a while. Um, in that specific instance, I was like, I just, I, I can't do it organically, so no. But then th they were 100% fine with that. That's not, a, it's, it's not something that I got in trouble for or anything. Um, so yeah, you've got the the authors who, 80% of the time, the studio, uh, the Black Library are coming to them and saying, "Can you do this for us?" And you know, they'll say yes, and then they'll write the uh, synopsis for the book and the chapter breakdown, and then that'll get approved by editorial. And there are some uh, who have never really, for example, me, I would never get that really for several reasons. One, they wouldn't be able to trust me with a deadline. There's just uh, publishing when you fuck up a deadline is incredibly expensive. And I have cost Games Workshop, you know, money in the past from, from my lateness. Um, you know, trying to get it all back into uh, back onto track. No, this this is this is fascinating to to me, Aaron, because um, so I am a corporate shill. I work at a corporation, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, I I work uh, very closely with marketing teams uh, as one of my core roles, um, mm -hmm. and have for a long time. And I'll know, and I've been a part of marketing campaigns. I've been a part of product releases. Um, and I know, you know, when a, a product manager is is working towards something that, you know, look, we've got November is going to be our deliverable. It's a, yeah. a key spend time or something in the environmental factors, you know, whatever every every industry has environmental factors, you know, retail booms and peaks at certain times. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, people that get money at, you know, uh, you know, after Christmas, you know, anyway, like everyone has environmental factors and you plan yeah. for those types of things in a product. Uh, and if we know that we're going to do a, a product release or there's something big, uh, let's let's bring it into a games workshop pers uh, perspective here. Let's say that, uh, I don't know, the Eldar are going to get a new codex in August. I, I make this up, guys. I don't know. I'm not saying that Eldar is getting a codex. Just That's just an example. Now, they know that, you know, the, they know this. They don't know this in 2020. They've, pro they've probably planned this for years oh yeah especially when there's new models in range usually yeah. from my understanding the development cycle is approximately two to three years before you get it from the from the initial concepts to the designing of the models to the testing of the models to the writing of the books to the the, the um usually the, the publication of books are at least three to five months before they're actually hitting the shelves so they're being already produced yeah anyway knowing that you know in in six months 12 months 18 months time i can imagine that there might be some incentives for a writer like yourself like hey look got eldar coming out in in 2021 who can put out a couple of books who can write a story about um about the avatar of kane or whatever it might be uh but then you know what that then means is that not everyone's writing about eldar they still yeah. need stories about space marines about you know stormcast about they need all other books so they still need this i guess they need a mixed right they can't yeah, have yeah. everyone focus on eldar because then every other faction gets no love um yeah. for a long time you see that's where like the other this is where the other branches come in like that's one reason they wouldn't ask me to do that kind of thing or because just you know there's a the deadline risk the uh, the second reason is they have asked me in the past and i've always said no because i don't i don't want to I don't want to do those kind of things. So, the, I mean, the money's good. <laughs> don't get me wrong, um, and it's cool to get like the publicity push of releasing when minis come out or when a codex comes out or whatever. Uh, but it's just well, this is the thing. Ideas are free, you know. Ideas are the easiest thing in the world, and there every single 40k fan or every single Warhammer fan has hundreds and hundreds of ideas that would make good. That would make good stories or good books 
and then when you do it professionally you have just as many if not more and so my schedule for example looks i mean i know what my schedule is looking like three or four or five years in advance and part of that's just because i'm so slow that it takes me like a year or a year and a half to write a novel and part of it's just because i've already locked in with editorial what i want or what i want to do and then and this is where the last branch comes in they know if they release it whatever it is it's probably going to sell if it, they they trust me enough to sell so i get that leeway i get the kind of leeway where i don't write like long synopsis of books you know i'll often write dear editor uh gray knights and then they'll send back you know yeah when I'll be like it's at some point as soon as i can you know it's like i know i'm i'm exaggerating for effect but it's not a million miles away from that i mean there's still like that i don't want to imply that i don't work with my editors because i have you know i, I work really closely with nick Kime and he's that man has crossed every t and dotted every i uh, of my 10 plus years at black library he's incredible with feedback he's excellent to talk story through with and he's you know he's he's an absolute gem so i work really hard with him but at the same time not at the pitch process uh, i think that comes i, I with... hand him a draft and then we talk about what i've just written well that comes with reputation over time right um yeah. you couldn't you couldn't have done that at the start of your tenure at black library um because you're just another name you're like who are you you haven't proven yeah. yourself but once you've proved yourself you've got runs on the board you've you know you've made some book sales um because i guess you know for the investment I, I, again i'll put my commercial hat on being the business person that i am mm. despite my beard but aaron did see my uh corporate photo on my gmail and then boy it was boy, horrifying it. horrifying <laughs> it was surprised to not see a beard on my face so uh i did update my linkedin profile recently to have my beard uh, but you know when i when you start your career and when you're working with somebody new you don't know who they are that you don't know the output they have no reputation yeah they might have a brand from another industry but you haven't proven yourself at this organization but i imagine once you've got wins on the board whether that's commercial sales that's volume of books sold uh whether that is positive press i know you are a new york uh bestseller uh, as well so getting accolades from industries you know once you build that reputation and people trust you and you've you know you've proven you can do it doesn't mean you have full autonomy it doesn't mean like you can just go do whatever you want whenever you want but they're more likely for you to take risks, to try different yeah. things, yeah. to uh, not maybe not ask as many heavy questions uh, as opposed to when you first started, like, give me a heavier synopsis. What's the delivery date? Well, trust is everything. Like, um, I'd, I handed in my second novel, Soul Hunter, and, like, I think it was on chapter two, like, the editorial comments on that, uh, said it was from nick and he was saying that he, he wanted me on the horus heresy team like just from chapter two of my second novel and from then like like that was just the most incredible like adrenaline rush like confidence boost you can get not just because you know you're like oh my god i'm gonna get to do this thing that i've always dreamed of but just because like you know your editor trusts you then you know and that's trust trust is absolutely everything uh hell's reach for example hell's reach is one of the a rare instance where um nick came to me and said that he wanted he said w would i do x and it was they were launching space marine battles and they were launching it with rin's world and then he said soul hunter was great um we want you to do a heresy novel but there's just there's no slot just yet so can you uh can you join this space marine battle series and i was like yeah of course that sounds awesome you know give me time to think up an idea and he said, well, we would like to do Black Templars and Hell's Reach is their really famous battle. Yeah, can you do a book about that? I was like, yeah, that would be that would be awesome. And like that was as far as the, the instruction for Hell's Reach went. Pretty much everything else has been me saying, look, I'd like to redeem Abaddon and explain how the Black Legion works and explain the metaphysics of chaos and what it's like to live in the Eye of Terror. And like you can sort of see Nick's eyes glaze over, and he goes, "This is going to be late. This is going to be so late." But like, yeah, okay, off you go. So that's that's kind of a, that's that's my pitching process. But I mean, like, and Dan's to be honest, Dan's is the same. Um, but there's no better way of doing it. Like I don't think I'm some maverick, lone wolf, renegade. You know, just because my pitching process is me 
driven instead of them driven. Like it's, there's, there's no difference. I'll probably make way more money and write about more popular factions if I was like taking some advice now and again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that's and that's the challenge as well, right? As a, I, I, I can imagine. Look, I, I talk from assumption, and I talk from a I related from other industries and other initiatives, but not necessarily being an author myself. Uh, but I can appreciate where you're kind of you're coming from, and I think the challenge as well is that you know you've got business demands, and then you've got personal personal things that you're interested in, and it's that Venn diagram of what what will sell what's interesting and what works for the organization because um like right now you might be really passionate to write um i don't know like something let's let's go gene stealers for example or something in, in age of sigma you're like oh i'd love to really write uh the story of malarian as we've already talked about you know being your favorite uh age of sigma character but they're like oh malarian's not important to us right now where it's yeah. a range we don't want to push or hey yeah. We're going to be redesigning the gene stealer range in 2022 because again they work so far ahead of the future either a write the book and we'll shelve it for a year just until we get closer to that date b if you write it now it's probably not going to sell as well as in 2022 when you know everyone's really excited to talk gene stealers um or no we don't want you to work on that just yet because we're doing stuff in the background so it's like put it on ice it's um or sometimes it's just a flat out no we don't think it's going to sell because of maybe previous sales of models whether it's um whether it's just like they don't want to push that range that they want to really push sisters and you know because of ga game ga uh, video game licenses and other uh, i guess other ips as well because i guess the black library is just one part of the storytelling yeah, in the yeah. games workshop universe this is also yeah that's that's 100 percent true and this is also what I mean when I talked about eras earlier. Like I've been with, um, yeah, I've been back library for like 12 years. They've been publishing my stuff, I think for 11. And I think it, there have been like six, five or six distinct eras that we all know about that have had, um, either different managing, um, like different top brass at the top of black library or black library has been integrated to various degrees with um the design studio or like you know it, right at the start it was they were completely uh isolated from each other then at one point black library was literally dissolved into publications and then they kind of went let's not do that anymore and then they brought you know because there was that period for about 18 months where everything was only tied into what was being released like the minis that were being released um, and admittedly, a few of the authors uh, got away, got out of that. Uh, again, like from trust and you know longevity or whatever. Um, like we, some of us were lucky like that. But at the same time, like that's that that's that's years ago now. Like that's it's, we've had like two more swings of the pendulum. Yeah, so it's that's that. This is what I mean when I say like there's no one path. Like the for example, the Dawn of Fire series that was Black Library driven. Like just like the uh, the Heresy series. That was Black Library saying, hey, we'd like to do this series. Then they ask, then they invite various authors on. And then the authors plan out what the narrative of the series is, working, in case of um, the Dawn of Fire series, you know, working really closely with the studio because it's so tied into the meta plot. Whereas the Heresy, it was just like, there was nothing. It's like, okay, let's just take that in whatever direction it goes in. Um, but if you look at something like mine and my, most of the stuff mine and Dan write, uh, me and Dan write, it's not remotely uh, related to any any release schedules. Do you know who does the best at this? I really admire Chris Rate because he has this motto. He says, one for me, one for the studio. <laughs> <laughs> that's how he writes. And I was like, that is, that's very mature. You know, he's like one that one that he just desperately wants to do. And then he's like one that he knows will sell really well and it's mm. about something that gw want and you know and yeah i think that's a really good way because there's not there's no difference in quality all this stuff is fantastic so it's not like there's no dip or anything and i imagine and i imagine uh and not to get into your bank account but i imagine there's financial benefits by writing books at a popular time so knowing that eldar was coming out you know in 2022 and having a book ready for 2022 
it's not like you're on a fixed salary, you know, you know, it doesn't matter. You're just pumping out articles for White Dwarf and Battle Tomes. You know, you've got some skin in the game to make sure that your books sell and, you know, you are fairly compensated for those. So I can imagine by having something for the release schedule or talking about character, uh, popular characters or popular armies, uh, there is some type of financial windfall um, to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't really speak from experience on that score because I'm so absolutely terrible at it. But again, this is one of the ways that Black Library have just been so fantastic to me. That they, like uh, when Space Wolves were redone recently, they, um, uh, they, yeah, no, they, they re-released um, my Ragnar Black main novel. Like I had no idea they were going to do that. And that, you know, that's, that was, that was awesome. I mean, obviously they didn't do it for me, but it was, you know, they hit me up and like, we, we were going to re-release Ragnar. Do you want to do a new introduction for it? And I would have done, but I was so freaking busy, but uh, you know, stuff like that as well. Like it's, they, they, they take care of us. You know, we're not, we're not just uh, nameless tools to them. And I, and I wanted to ask some of these questions because uh, I guess being a professional author, again, it's not a job that I have, uh, but it's it's so shrouded in mystery. You yeah, know, people yeah. wonder, how do I make that jump? You know, and um, Night Lords, uh, Le 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 Leviathan, blah, 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 um, had mentioned, you know, you just can't rock, knock up on Games Workshop door. Uh, it's not like the olden days with like a demo, like, hey, famous band, here's my mixtape. Can you give it a listen? Uh, let's do a collab. Uh, you know, you can't just, you know, knock on the door, you know, there's so much demand and, yeah. um, you know, there's now official submission dates and submission, hey, we're looking for, I think, was it late last year, there was a, a call for Warhammer Horror authors. Yeah. Yeah. So um, submissions are normally once every year, I think it is. Yeah, so, so you know, uh, at the moment there is, you know, it seemed like I think for the last couple of years there's been this towards the end, like September, October, there seemed to be this uh, submission date for Black Library. They'll tell you what they're looking for and they'll give you a topic or they'll they'll, they'll kind of give you a framework of a, a theme or something. Um, so I imagine for anyone who's looking to make that break, and I, I guess as well, like, you know, I know a lot of authors, more commercial business authors than they are, and I think, one of the challenges as well is, you know, more and more publishing houses, uh, Not, I don't know how Black Wall Library comes into this, but they also want the guarantee that you'll sell books. Yeah, yeah. And one, of the, one of the ways they do that is they look at your, uh, I guess, your, your your social media, your connection with your your fan base. Uh, you know, once you write that book, what's your, what's your ability to then push it out to the world to say, hey, buy my book um, and not just rely on the publishing house to, to do all the advertisement for you. So, and then obviously off the back of your success, they will more likely push your books. But I guess, you know, again, lifting yeah, the little, little bit, it's just the relationship I wanted to kind of, yeah. I guess. Um, that's no, that's a really good point. Um, but it's not a case of, like, again, this comes down to different eras, but I've probably been in trouble for, about so my social media more than, more than most. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate to say more than any, but more definitely more than most. I would I definitely, to... I would definitely say that you weren't the top. I've seen some people, uh, but yeah, it's 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 very funny because um, I know again, like when I I used to work with LinkedIn, and I would actually talk to a lot of companies, and you know, I'd actually share with them that you know, while this is your professional brand, you are representative of an organization. So there's this very fine line when you work for a company, what you can and can't do. And yes, it might be a personal account, but you're still representative of a brand. So um, I guess I guess if you're an aspiring author, I guess the point that I was trying to make there was around how you can live, how can you can come to an author and de-risk a, a publication by having an audience and uh, an audience who is willing to buy your product as opposed to uh, an author who might write really good stuff, but has no social presence so that when they go out, they go, hey, I've got this amazing book about Malarian. They're like, mm. who are you? What's your, you what's your that. street cred? You say that, but Dan has, like, practically no social media presence. And I would be willing to bet, honestly, that Black Library would be happier if I didn't have one. But Dan has a <laughs> reputation. He already has, he already has yeah. reputation. If I was an aspiring author right now, that might be a little bit different, right? Because I don't have a brand yet. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I guess it's like a defensive thing, to be honest. I just find it quite hacky in a way if someone's like, if they do their social media 
purely for publicity. I just find that quite hacky and tacky. But I mean, again, I guess it's like the, I, I, I've had the luxury of, because I just might use mine to just talk about my family or talk about going mad or talk about the law. Um, it was never for publicity. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, again, there's no one, there's no one route. Again, I, I don't think mine's, mine's certainly not the professional way of doing it, which is, um, I mean, I've, I've been in trouble a lot. That's, that's fine. And that's, that's, that's a, a company policy and their risk tolerance and things. But to get us back on topic, I'm going to ask Eric, you said, how does someone uh, from the UK uh, become a Phoenix Suns fan? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> way back when the world was young, um, when I was like 13 or something, I uh, played Tecmo Super NBA Basketball. On my friend Snez. Yep. And uh, he had a player he really liked that he that he used to shoot threes all the time. And so did I. And his was John Stockton and mine was Danny Ainge. And then like a couple of years later, we were like, just we, he got a basketball net in his back garden. So we were like playing it. And then we started to watch it like when Sky Sports would allow us to watch basketball, you know, once every two weeks or whatever, for 15 seconds. And we had to decide, okay, well, who were our teams? And we said, okay, whatever team Stockton and Ainge play on, those are going to be our teams. And my friend Nick, uh, he Stockton still played on the Utah Jazz. So he's a lifelong Jazz fan now. And I, uh, Danny Ainge was playing, he was sixth man on the Phoenix Suns when they were awesome. And it was just the best time to be a Suns fan. It was, it was just so pure. <laughs> it was just so good. And then they sucked pretty much ever since Steve Nash left. So blah, 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 blah. Long story short. Yeah, I'm, I'm a lifelong Suns fan. And it, it's kind of Danny Ainge's fault, really. So that's why I have the, the poster of an otherwise unremarkable player. But he's the one who got me into basketball. I was always a number three fan of the Phoenix. So for me, it was always Charles Barkley. Um, and there was a Mega Drive game back in the day or a Genesis if you're from America. It was like Charles Barkley, shut up and jam. Uh, and it was like, it was street ball. So I'd always play the NBA and I was always at an Orlando Magic and Chicago Bulls. I was just at Anthony Hardaway, Anthony Hardaway, and um, and obviously Jordan, you know, the goat. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the Phoenix Sun, and I love that street ball. I love that Charles Barkley. So um, it was straight up hot fire. But uh, bringing us back to Black Library and um, there's so many cool questions. And, uh, guys, I wish I could answer all of your questions. I'm trying to avoid some of the very granular questions. I can see some really cool stuff, you know, and I guess for the, the topic that we're talking about, I, I, we can't get into the weeds as much as I'd love to talk about your favourite Dark Tower book, as much as I'd love to uh, to bring up those types of things. I think we've got to keep to this, the topic um otherwise we'll be here for that ama that that 10 hour ama which i don't have a problem with but i've got a uh, a family lunch to go to and you've got to go to sleep but have you praised the emperor today i'm sad to say i have not i have written for the emperor though because i i downed my work tools literally like 10 minutes before this uh, conversation started so yeah i've written about the emperor today praise praise the emperor you, you, you talked a little bit about the IP manager, because I guess for me, one of the challenges that I would see about writing Warhammer is there's just so much law. 40K has a law that goes back 30 plus years. Warhammer Fantasy had a law of 30 plus years. Age of Sigma now has five a five year law, but you've also got White Dwarf publications. You've got you know many different books from, from um, Black Library. How, how do you, like, how do you write a story and keep continuing with a theme and tapping into that that wonderful history. Because I imagine, you know, you can't read every book, every piece of law known to man. Is, is there an encyclopedia? Is there a uh, like like how do, how on earth do you do you do it without stepping on people's toes and retconning things? You know, um, on, on, you know. Sometimes we 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 do we, we do retcon, but how do you avoid that? You know, how do you proofread that you don't contradict yeah. the law that's been written in the past or like how does that all kind of come about okay get comfortable this is going to be long no please right. this is because this is fascinating this is fascinating because something like a space marine has been around for a long time there's been a yeah, lot yeah. written about 
the the various armor suits alone you know the mk1s yeah, yeah. to like it's just how do you like how do you do it yeah um again a lot of this comes down to different eras um where the, how the company was structured and how how you know who's working where and what their what their mandate is but really it comes down to that idea of there is no 40k like there's no fact there's no like core thing that it's just like a bundle of facts there's there's a vibe and there is there's classic lore that was just drenched in that vibe and you tap at it you know you mine it and then you take that feeling and then you run with it in a different direction at, at the core that's if you're writing for warhammer that's your job now some people may not know the law as well as uh like i said before i've been into this since i was eight i'd be willing to venture that i know no one knows what they don't know don't get me wrong but my knowledge is pretty encyclopedic however that doesn't mean anything really like that, that doesn't make me better at this like if uh, i've said this before like if you put me and dan abner in a quiz like I would beat him a hundred times out of a hundred in a law quiz, but like, are you like, are you trying to tell? Like he doesn't, he doesn't read codexes, he doesn't read battle terms. But are you trying to tell me that Dan Abnett doesn't understand 40k? You know, like Dan Abnett defines 40k. That man, he, he, you, you cut him and he bleeds Zagrax Earthshade. You know, like he, he, he invented the box. Like he, he, he is 40k in a lot of ways, and that's that's why. Like I think a lot of, and I say a lot of, I think some fans who kind of take law videos as like as, as sometimes as everything it's like as gospel it's like that's just that's just information it's just data it's not it's not always law um okay which then ties back into games workshop doesn't we don't like to retcon there aren't times because the the law is so you know it's loose it's loose canon that's that's like the jokey way of referring to it that means it's very difficult to get something wrong unless you get the tone wrong, right? Details are often like it's intentionally left vague so you can play around with stuff and so you can overlap so you're not beholden to X, Y, Z. Um, there are times when something will be too, uh, it'll have maybe like gotten a bit too much prominence and it'll like start to be memed or whatever and then instead of retconning it what usually happens is gw just doesn't mention it again mm. and that's it's very very rare um i, I like the, cl the classic example is the blood ravens like everyone's like oh they're loyalist thousand sons and the point is they might be like that's awesome that's cool but it once you say they are that's not really what this this that's that's not what this ip is about like that's not it's cool and it's fan service and a lot, of, a lot of fans desperately want it. And that's cool. Like, but like the mandate sort of came down from on high. It's like, stop saying they are and like, you're not, you're not supposed to say they are. And because actually, because I was the one talking publicly at the time about it, I got the blame for it. All the people who want them to be thousand sun successes, like, Oh, ADB hates the blood Ravens. I fucking love the blood Ravens. I think they're awesome. I just, you know, happened to be the one who was saying, yeah actually i would quite like the mystery the mystery is better and it's very rare they do something like that but occasionally like someone from the absolute top brass will go no 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 no! please don't mention that again so that's another way that you, you don't you don't tread on people's toes perfect example of that in sigma and, it, and it's interesting when you see like internet fights and they'll yeah. always like snip it like one line it was referred once in yeah. a white dwarf or in a book and it's just one reference that is like 10 years, 15 years, or they just keep kind of pushing it down your throat. And the one that comes up in Sigma all the time is the relationship with Tomb Kings and Cetra. And, you know, in one book, there was one reference to a Stormcast that died called yeah. Cetrus. And people are just like, lol, Cetrus, Cetra is a Stormcast. He's gone. Cetra is never coming back. You know, I think there's only one reference. And it's that one. And like, there's never been a reference ever again. So it's yeah, interesting yeah. when you say that it's not like they come out and say, no, this is not true. They just stop mentioning it, but they just keep bringing up this one little article, which, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting to say that because again, Warhammer is just stories, right? And, yeah, yeah. and, and that's why I, there's, there's some, in Age of Sigma, I really love the destruction stories because 
they're not told by the Stormcast. And when you listen to a Stormcast audio drama, it, it's a Stormcast. It's a paladin, you know. Um, everyone is evil, you know. It's just like it's the righteous and the pure. But then you see other sides of, like, the orcs, the goblins, the, um, the, the giants and the ogres, and it's the way that they tell stories, the way that they perceive the world. And reading the Sons of, of, of Behemoth Armies, the way that they tell stories are these through these, these very tribal feats of strength that you would have imagined in the very, very, very early days. And um, now does that mean that um, uh, a giant literally ate the sun? No. Did they literally drink all the water in the ocean? No. It's just a story, and I think we interpret it the way that we want to, uh, how it, what it means to us. And yeah. I think you're right. Like it's just because someone wrote a book doesn't make it fact, true, and law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it can be challenged in the future, and it doesn't make it wrong. It just means like there's always three sides of a story: your version, my story, and the in the middle. Yeah, yeah. See, this is one of the things I think AOS does really, really well. Um. Okay, because like you, you make that you you give the perfect example, right? Like it's just destruction are brilliant at this. They like you get all these cultural stories through the lens of that culture. How much is true? It it literally doesn't matter. And I think in some ways that's difficult for fans of other IPs that like wander into 40k because they are looking for facts, they're looking for definitives, they're looking for answers. And it's like this is not the IP. That, like it is intentionally crafted and guarded against that. Like, and it's it's not. Sometimes you see it dismissed as like laziness, like to not agree uh, with other interpretations. But it's like it's the point. The easiest thing in the world would be just to agree with each other. Like the point is to put your own spin on it and to put, um, you know, to to look to look at the setting through your lens. Like if you're writing for Black Library, your job ultimately is to show the setting through your lens. Now, a lot of the times that will agree. Like, I mean, there's a reason me, uh, Chris Raitt and John French are such good friends. We see the setting in exactly the same way. Our stuff has the exact same kind of tone. You know, our, our prose doesn't really particularly read very similarly, but like we all see 40K the same way. Rachel Harrison is the same as well. Like she just, her vision of 40K, I just, I just love it. And it's familiar and it makes sense to me. And sometimes she'll like, come up with something that I haven't thought of or whatever. And that's that's just kind of how that's that's your job, you know. You there here's your lens, show the setting. That's that's kind of and yeah, you're right. Destruction does that really, really well. But I think it creates like a space that um Glowden was asking a little bit earlier was around and while we are not going directly to this particular question, I wanted to call this out because you know I think one thing that I love about space marines and you know I'm, I'm I don't collect space marines, uh, but it does create probably the range that creates the most opportunity to create your own lore and your own heroes and your own stories. Uh, and despite it's just a humble space marine and people wonder why Stormcast Eternals were introduced into fantasy, you just need to look at, you know, the customization levels and the yeah. storytelling that the space marines bring to the story. But as you said, they're not always the good guys. Um, and I love, at least in Age of Sigmar, where I spend most of my time reading lore, you yeah. get to see the other side more. And um, like, I remember, I remember reading this story. There was a time where um, in the lead up to Malign Sorcery, there was a, a little event called the Malign Portents. And there's these little stories leading up to the event. And there was this one particular time where there was a, you know, generic human, you know, a father and son uh, living in their little house. And, um, and they were like, they had Nurgle's rot. They were kind of dying. And in the story, the, the, the Stormcast found them, and you would think, oh, cool, Stormcast are the good guys. They're going to go help these people who have been uh, yeah. affected by Nurgle's touch and heal them up and save them. Actually, cut sick and killed them, killed mm -hmm. the father and the son. And, and it's, it's those moments that you realise that, that good isn't good uh, or order isn't good. The Imperium yeah, yeah. isn't good. The yeah. Imperium believes what they're doing is good but not necessarily are the good guys it reminds me of the karate kid i always believed that daniel was not the good guy the cobra kai were the good guy danny daniel was the uh like like you came into me stole my girlfriend you ruined my, my city mm. but it's the way we perceive the world and who you identify with and it's those opportunities that allow us to tell more stories and debate and have fun and i love that vagueness 
um, in the in the storytelling. Yeah, uh, again, that's one of the things that's in, in, very intentional. Like it's you, um, it's for, it's Warhammer, right? Everyone's wrong. That's the point. Everyone is ignorant. Everyone is wrong, and I mean that's just that's the best storytelling foundation you're ever going to get. You know, every single person in the story is kind of wrong, and I mean, basing characterization on that, it's just a gold mine because as long as you can make someone's delusions convincing, like why they believe something and um, like what brought them to that, what brought them to that point, you know, then then you're you're home free because you've got half of a credible character there, and that's that's just that's pure Warhammer. In fact, that's what sets Warhammer apart from from a lot of other IPs. Like every everyone's wrong, no one's good, no one's right. Do you think, uh, as Daniel's pointed out, the Thousand Sons and the Prospero Burns are good examples where the events are told from two different perspectives? I think that's it's almost too blunt, actually, that that example, because that's like it's almost like the definitive one, but it's almost like so in your face that it's almost it's almost all encompassing. It's, you have, it's difficult to take a step back from. Uh, it, it's I more mean it in just in terms of everyone on their day to day existence you know your, your average imperial citizen not that there is such a thing as an average imperial citizen i mean it's 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 millions of separate cultures you know all uh pushed together by the fact that they pay taxes you know that's that's literally it and they praise the emperor not even you know they wouldn't even agree on what the emperor really is mm. but whatever um yeah it's like just that every person in the setting has a, just a fundamental level of ignorance and it's the same in Age of Sigmar, just because the, the scale of Age of Sigmar and the pressure of these gods around you, like, you know, throwing their points of view, so to speak, on you. Well, it's interesting because in the Gloom Spike Gits battle tome, um, the, the Gloom Spike Gits for any of the 40k people joining us, um, they talk about it's a combination of armies. They brought together these generic grots, the Moon Clan Gits. Uh, Moon Clan Grots, they brought together the Spider Guys, the Spider Fang, they brought together um, they brought together a whole bunch of them. And, and what I love about that that one single source of truth, this battle tome, is that each of the tribes, the the gloom spot, the, the gits, the yeah. uh, the spiders, uh, the troll, the trolls, the trogoths, they all perceive the bad moon, which is, yeah. you know, the, I guess the light. Um, they all perceive it differently. The spiders think it's a big egg. Um, you know, some people have, you know, ideas that it was uh, Gorka Morka tried to eat it. They all literally in the same army, they have different stories. So it just shows you that there, again, there is no one single source of truth. And I, and I love that that ability to interpret. And, you know, Hey, hey Wo made a really good point that, you know, it's those different myths from the unrelatable narrators that kind of make it fun. They bring yeah, it together yeah. and you speculate and what does this mean? And then what does it mean to my army? Um, and it gets me talking at the end. I don't want to, it's a game of Thrones effect. I don't want games of Thrones to tell me everything. And then I don't talk at the water, water cooler. Mm -hmm. I want to speculate. What does this mean? How do I respond? What would we do? Why don't we do this? And I love that, that vagueness, um, to allow me to enter the world as opposed to just being told the pure facts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, like just giving answers would be the easiest thing in the world. Just saying it's this and then everyone has to write that, that's easy as hell. Like the, finding all the different ways something could be true, that's, that's, that's the point of the setting, you know? That's the vibe. I want to talk about character development, and I know we've, we've, we've been talking about it a lot, but I actually want to get into deep with the characters and... You mentioned earlier about the process of getting into a baton and some of the um, some of the things that you did to research. But I guess you know, taking maybe a step back, what were what are some of the keys in your opinion? And again, you mentioned every author is different, but what, in your opinion, what are some of the keys to building uh, you know a compelling, interesting, believable character that I would care about? Either I care because I support them. Or because I hate them and I want them to die or to suffer. Um, like, how do you approach character development? Um, oh Christ. <laughs> uh, okay. This is one of those questions where you think, "Wow, I wish I prepared." <laughs> no, um, this is this is this is this is ADB freestyle. Okay. No, it's uh, okay. I can, well, I've got like a few 
like hokey sort of phrases that I you know think about and like who who are you on the worst day of your life? That's the one I always like to think about with characters. And I'm not much of a planner, to be honest. What I do is I'll just start writing a book and what will inevitably happen is I'll get twenty thousand words into it, which is about a, a fifth of the way through a book, which is a good good few months work for me. And then I'll go, No, I hate this and I'll start again. And often that can happen more than once. But long story short, I'll like just keep writing and grinding and trying stuff out. And when I find the characters in a situation that I like, I'm like, okay, th this is who they are. But that comes down to who are you on the worst day of your life? What, because who you, who you are in unexceptional circumstances doesn't really matter. It's once like, once the mask falls off, once your life's gone to hell, that's who the character is. That's interesting. Why are they like that? What circumstances brought them to be like that? Why are they a certain way when you may have expected them not to be like that? That's, that's often like an absolute uh, gold mine of narrative. You know, um, the, the, the Stormcast example you gave just then was, was a good one because you'd think, oh, thank God, <laughs> the Sigmar's sons are here. And it's like, stab. Um, if you're a yeah. wrestling fan, I always call that the Vince Russo swerve, where. Vince Russo, a very well-known writer in the wrestling world in the 90s, would right. do these stupid little, like, you think it's happening, and then it's like a quick turn and, like, it catches you out. And sometimes it was really ridiculous, but sometimes <laughs> you're like, oh. And, like, you watch TV and, like, you, you can predict what's going to happen. You're like, oh. and, and it happens at the end. You're like, cool, I, I could have not watched this. Yeah. But then sometimes, like, something completely unpredictable, you're like, oh, my gosh. And, you know, the speculation, the ideas, the energy just kind of gets brought up. So... Um, I love that. On, on just on that note, actually, it's like a side, uh, an antechamber to that point. Um, the notion of subverting expectations is like that's that's something that's quite. Let's not mention any movie names, but that's something that's quite a hot topic lately. But the thing is, that one of the keys to good writing is not to give people what they want; is to give them what they didn't realize they wanted. However. You can't just subvert expectations for the sake of shock constantly or for the, just for the sake of subverting ex expectations. It has to be within a framework. It has to be within the tone of the IP you're writing in. It has to be within what, the, what these characters that you're getting attached to would credibly do. Otherwise, this is, this is something that this is like the biggest truth in writing, in writing uh, prose, um, well, in fiction and nonfiction. Confusion is the enemy. Like if your if your readers are confused, that's it. You're fucked. Um, and I, I can't I can't overstate the importance of that. If you're in if you're like halfway through a scene and you're not really sure like who's there or why or why they're acting that way or there's there's a difference between like a thread of mystery that you're starting to uncover and then there's just a reader not really knowing like the the time space of what's going on. If a reader is confused about something, you're screwed. You need to just highlight and delete that whole thing and start over because that's 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 narrative poison and yeah so subverting expectations and twists and stuff that's you know always do that within the the, the framework of what the, the story you're trying to tell and the setting you're writing in and which is the whole vince russo thing is it got to a point where it worked once which was really cool but then you just do it for the sake of doing it and it loses all impact and the minute you find out that you know adb is writing a novel you know there's a swerve coming and you know a swerve doesn't become a swerve if you know it's coming it's predictable and i think yeah, yeah. Uh, that then kind of ties in nicely what robert was saying around you know sometimes you know when you're writing i imagine there's these points where the, the characters start writing for themselves and you've got early momentum and you know you're in the mindset of that character and you just it becomes a lot easier once you've unlocked it i imagine you know all the hard work you did re researching mental illness and some of the ideas you had around a um like then start kind of like you just get this momentum as just the creative juices or um as uh, who i can't remember which writer talked about it you get in flow you just get into a yeah. state where you just like you just punch out all the goodness and you edit. I don't know if this is your process as well and, and we'll get to process soon, but like when I'm being very creative, I just write, 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 write. And then I edit later. There's no point in like writing a line and then, you know, seeing if it's grammatically correct because that stop start mentality will break your flow. You just write, 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 write. And then you critique later and then you revise later, but just get all the juices going as you can. 
Uh, in some ways, I'm the opposite. Um, the, the, we'll, I'll tie this back into the, the, the character question. But yeah, I'm very precise. Um, please note that I'm not saying good. I'm saying I'm precise. It's like my painting. I'm very neat. I'm not like, I, can't, I don't have like loads of tricks and wet blending and stuff. I'm just super neat. And w when it comes to writing, I'm not like do it all and then edit it. My, um, my editor has a, a phrase where he just says that my, my drafts are always really clean and I, I don't get edited very much because by the time I've reached the point of a first draft, I have written and rewritten and rewritten the whole thing sentence by sentence as I'm writing it. I've talked about it a thousand times with um, like the other with the guys that I, you know, that, that I work with or with my friends. I've inevitably had six, seven, 50 pep talks with them where I'm like, this novel's running away from me. I have no idea what I'm doing. Can you help me? And they'll read it and go, it's fine. Just keep going. Or they'll suggest something and I'll be like, oh yeah, 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 yeah let's, let's do that. Um, so my writing process is drastically unprofessional at times. Um, I get there in the end, but uh, yeah, no, sorry. No, to, to I, 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 no, I'll challenge you and disagree that it's not that it's not professional. You have, a, you have an approach. Um, <laughs> I, I subscribe to the approach. So I think it was Disney who created who created this in the in the early 1900s, where Disney would have in their in their corporate headquarters that have four different rooms, and um, each of the rooms has has a theme. So the first one was a creativity room, and the whole idea of the creativity room was that you could not criticize in the creativity room. You oh, couldn't talk about like if it was possible or should we do this. It was purely for ideation. But then yeah. you go into a different room and that's where it might be the critiquing. So you bring in a different mentality. And for me, when I try to get creative, I, I find I just write all my notes. I might not write a whole novel. I might not do a whole video presentation. I'll write up a bunch of things. Then I'll take a step back to go, right, where are the gaps? What should I expand upon? What do I talk too much about? But I think what you've highlighted is that there is different approaches. There's no one single way to be an author, one single way to create a character that you find iterating. And what I love hearing from you is that you're socializing. You're getting a, like a stress test with, you know, people either, people you trust, other writers. Um, oh, yeah. when, you've got a, when you've got a block or you're like, oh, I don't know, really know where I'm going, getting a fresh set of eyes. Sometimes you can't see the forest from the trees going, oh, yeah. oh I really like that. Or why don't you try this? Or have you thought about this? then yeah. you kind of get back on track or you get new ideas. So sometimes socializing, it gets you out of the rut. No, that's, that's, that's exactly true. That's, that's exactly my process and quite, quite a lot of people's process as well. <laughs> I'm not professional says the New York best. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not professional. I don't get paid to write Warhammer. No, <laughs> I, I haven't. I'm not. <laughs> what I mean to say is there is room for discipline and maturity in my current system that's what i mean but we yeah, can get all back, grow and learn yeah well yeah um to get back to the, the character flow question um yes characters constantly write themselves you'll find that especially if you have a really good grounding in the story you're trying to tell or not even if you know where it'll end up because often i have no no idea but if you know the setting well enough and you know how the faction functions then it's like just telling stories on on earth because you know earth so you know you know reality so well it's easy to write a story you know um and yeah it's like that sometimes it, the characters would just go off and do xyz i'm how yeah i mean i can't think of another way that hasn't happened to be honest do you find um do you find writing about well-known characters easier or harder than writing I wouldn't say a non-named character, but, you know, you talked about Ragnar, you talked about, you know, Magnus, or we talked about a and we talked about, you know, these really big characters, these known characters, Nagash, Archeon. Yeah. You know, is it is it easier to write? Because you wrote the Slaves to Darkness battle term or you at least contributed to the lore. I, uh, I read the, the, the four short stories. So with that, was it, e would, would it, do you find it easier to write about a known character like an Archeon, or would you find it easier to write about a champion in the Varen Guard, you know, an upcoming um, uh, Chaos Lord uh, that, that has a, a story to tell yeah. uh, that doesn't have a lot of reputation. But then on the flip side, Archeon is so established, it's now just, I guess, a continuation of the story. I don't know, like, what's 
what do you find easier from your experience? Uh, no, that's a great question. I, I don't, to be honest, I don't think there's a difference in difficulty, just in approach. And you have to understand that I'm always approaching these famous characters, usually as cameos or as the, uh, or even if like the, the main characters are extremely uh, close to the, like, I mean, a lot of the main characters in the Black Legion series are, they're Abaddon's inner circle. They're the ones who know him the best, but they all know different elements of him. They're all sent around on different uh, missions and they, yeah. So it's, um, I, I, I try not to go into their heads. Like the master of mankind is another good example. Like there's nothing definitive in that book. Absolutely nothing. Every single thing about the emperor in that book is like for, for a start, 95% of it is just old law. But it's old law through the eyes of people in the presence of the emperor and they all have different agendas and different beliefs and admittedly a lot of them absolutely despise space marines and despise the primarchs because why wouldn't they the horus heresy is their fault the galaxy is on fire because of these idiots so when you yeah like i know so it's very difficult to like be clear about what's effectively like the fundamental principle about how you write IP work because you, 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 I want to be really precise. I don't want to, and I don't want to come across like I'm criticizing people who do it differently because, because I'm not. Um, but it's, again, it's the same thing with historical fiction. When you're right, you, you're writing about the people who, like you're writing about Lancelot instead of King Arthur, you know, what does Lancelot think of King Arthur? What does, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do Alexander the Great's generals think of him or what's it like to be one of them what's it like to be in his presence that that interests me i don't really care what um you know like what the what the actual i don't care what archaeon thinks i care what it's like to live in a in a world where archaeon is real yeah what does that like what does that mean but again like like the malarian example i gave you know to you'd have so many different religions worshiping that character like what does that feel like what the hell does that what does that do to you like what is what is it what's it like to live in algu or you know just I, yeah those, those are the like, that's the angle i come at it from that's not always the angle like you that's not a definitive angle because a lot of people do just stay in a main character's head all the time like a, a famous character and that works great but it's just not it's just not my personal preference no, we, we, we come from a similar school of thought. I remember in Age of Sigma, one of the most important videos that were ever produced in Age of Sigma was Phil Kelly explaining the relationship of the mortal realms and how oh God, the yeah. different realms interacted. And it was that moment. There was a long-standing joke in, in, in Age of Sigma where people were talking about, like, what about the farmers? You yeah, know, yeah. What, what are, what are the, what's the produce that the farmers grow in the different cities? And it was a bit of a meme. It was a bit of a joke. But it was mm -hmm. also what I related to being an old world player. Absolutely. I I had maps and I I, I knew my map. I knew where uh, Altdorf was. I knew its relationship to Middenheim. I knew its relationship to Bretonia. I knew above me was Kislev and Chaos. I knew yeah. that Ar Araby was here. I knew Wood Elves were here. And it was that grounded sense of the world that I could then tell a story. But then on the flip side, when Age of Sigmar became very high fantasy, it, it didn't have the groundedness that I needed. Yep. So yep. yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more, and I think uh, I love this comment. I wanted to bring it up from from uh, Leviathan again. Is is, is Talos one, uh, Talos uh, met Abaddon, and it was an important moment for Abaddon. It was just the Thursday, and <laughs> that's the different perspectives that yeah. you both yeah. said. But it just shows you that you know we all bring different meanings and retelling a story. Um, you know, in, in Age of Sigmar, you've got you know the the Age of Myth where the different gods started to fracture. And yeah. it's all told by Sigma, but I'd love to hear what Nagash's version is. And Nagash right now is rising up going, hey, guys, you're stealing my souls. You promised souls to me. Um, Stormcast and, and Sigma is like, well, no, they're my souls. We're going to reforge and, you know, beat off chaos. Mm -hmm. But then but then Nagash sees it very, very differently. And I love even revisiting these old stories from a different perspective and going, oh, yeah, you know what? Sigma is a bit of a jerk. You know what? He is a bit of a selfish person douche like yeah like nagash here is you know getting raided by corn 
And I think for me, the character development, but then on the flip side, you know, with a, a, such an established character like Nagash, there's so much lore already told. How much, how many more stories can you tell or uh, yeah. how much are you just kind of going over old ground? So I, I can, I can see that there's awesome stuff to do with, you know, but then uh, Marathi, Marathi has a new story to tell. She's just become a god. Uh, she has siphoned these souls from Slanesh and they're corrupted now. So it's not like the old dark elf Marathi. We have a new Marathi and her story is evolving. And um, that's what I'm loving seeing from authors like yourself. That's actually one of the, that's a, that's a really good point. And this is, again, again this is going to branch. Um, but AOS does that quite specifically where, um, okay, let's dial it back to the basics. People say that like AOS is a story and it, it, it's not. And it, it's when I say that's wrong, I don't mean that's bad. I mean, it's technically incorrect because it's a setting with a meta plot. And that's something that's, it's, it sounds like nothing. And yet it's kind of everything because it's not a story, a setting with a meta plot is what's what's happening is these are the setting defining events right and it's all happening and it's but then it trickles down to what us lot and our characters and our generals and our armies are kind of all fighting about and obviously the old world was a lot more like that and you kind of have to balance that with the fact that gw is a miniatures company and um people like to field lariel you know, people like to field Belisarius core. People, you know, like to field Mortarian, for example. And I'm not the kind of person who say, oh, you should never do that. That's, you know, but I, I will say that like th those characters have just no place on my table. I'm not interested in what they're doing in the meta plot. I'm interested in what it is like to live in the realms, why people fight in the realms, what they're fighting for, where they live, why they live there. Because all of it is so You've only got so much word count. And I, personally speaking, I don't care what the gods are doing particularly. Uh, so the more word counts that's devoted to Marathi's quest for godhood, it's, an, it's, it's enough for me to know that she's trying to quest for godhood. If you if had enough context about the rest of the realms, I could fill in all the blanks and that would be cool. Like I don't, I don't exactly care what Malarian is specifically seething about. I just love the idea of this insane monstrous god mm -hmm on top of a mountain, hiding an entire realm in shadows, just just hating. And every invading army that goes into those shadows, well, they don't come back. Like, that's, that's fucking awesome. Like, that, that is, that's Warhammer, you know? But I, I love that. I don't care about Alariel and Marathi fighting with spears and, and stuff like that. That said, I have to be completely honest here, I understand my opinion is not popular, <laughs> and I also understand that. Come on, those those models are just—they're amazing. I'll give the the, the kind that I like uh, the example that I would prefer to write about, for example, and that I would rather have in my army is like the Eidolon of Mathlan, because that's not Mathlan; it's it's the echo of this dead god, and there are hundreds of them. You know, there are the hundreds of these fragments of the slain god, and I love that. That is just yes, please. I don't care I, what necessarily what Teclis is doing. I care what an Ideneth army who is desperate enough to summon a shard of their dead god. I care what they're doing. What the hell brings you to that? Like that straight, you know, where you're going. Okay, let's summon an avatar of our dead god to win this fight. You know, I love that. I'm I'm all, I'm all over that in my games, and that's just the kind of stuff I like to read law wise as well. I completely it's, agree with you about Phil's video when he like contextualized the realms because that was just like click. I love the setting now. It's it's, just, it's it's when things made sense to me. And yeah. I think that's those moments where uh another one in Age of Sigma, and I'm sure there's plenty of these examples in 40k. So um uh surprise, I'm talking Age of Sigma on, on AOS Coach. Um, but you know, there was another one there, there's an RPG that came out 12 months ago called Soulbound, uh, an Age yeah. of Sigma RPG. And they put out a whole massive map about Akshi. So it was more than just the knowing about the four cities in Akshi. There's all this stuff, and we know the Age of Chaos um invaded or corn especially invaded Akshi, you know, in the in, in the Age of Myth. 
And but now there's all this stuff, all these ruins. I can see the relationship between Tempest Eye and, and Hollow Heart and Anvil Guard. And, you know, in the latest Broken Realms Marathi, when Marathi took over Anvil Guard and turned it into Harkuron, I now know where Anvil Guard is and I know how far it is from Hollow Heart. And I run a Hollow Heart army. So now I know that Marathi is on my doorstep. And yeah. I've now got a narrative arc that I can start playing with to go, right, I need to defend or be prepared for Marathi or break, break an alliance. Mm -hmm. And I love these moments, and, and I agree with you. It's not just don't tell me, create a space for me. Soul, soul, mm -hmm. um, the soul wars. We had psychic awakening in 40k. We've currently got broken realms and age of sigma. It's that then down trickle effect of what the meta or what the uh, the story arcs are going to impact yeah. all the various armies. And uh, again, I just want to be 100 percent clear. I don't think it's it's not you're not having bad wrong fun if you like to have Magnus or Motarian or Alariel on your tabletop, you know, it's cool to tell like the famous battles that they might have fought in. I mean, I've written enough Primarch, you know, battles with Primarchs there. So I, I, I get it. You know, I'm just saying as a general rule, I think that should be the spice, you know, it should be the icing. If the setting is deep and entrenched enough, and obviously AOS is so new still that it's, you know, it, it's, it's doing work in that direction all the time. Um, but yeah, if the setting is deep and entrenched enough, you, you, you just got to trust your readers, you know, that you, you trust them to fill in the blanks. And being a Dwarden player or a Dwarf player, um, I agree with Fisco here, is I would love to see more about the Caradron Society and maybe maybe you could be <laughs> one to help lead us to the trade merchants that are KO. Um, and, I, and, and Julian, I would say that, um, that Phil's video is on YouTube. It's... Um, I'll try to dig up the, the the video later, but if you just type in Phil Kelly or Mortal Realms, uh, it's about a five to seven, seven minute video, very animated video, kind of shows the, where the realms are and you know the relationship and you understand between light and shadow and um, those types of videos then just open up such a massive space. And I guess, you know, to, to tap into Night Lord's um, question. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. Oh, you want to go back? We'll go back. Thing, right? Yeah, please, KO. Do do you remember the first KO battle tome, like the softback one? Yeah. It was like quite super early, you know, when, it, when they were still like releasing armies, like in quite small chunks. But like that battle tome was great. Like for me, that was the first great battle tome because it presented their society. And I was like, I instantly, I knew what they were all about. I knew where they lived, why they lived there. Um, I, I knew what they did with their daily lives. I knew about the, all the guilds. And I just, I absolutely love that stuff. And the, the cool thing is their rules, like I love how even they're like the articles and uh, that kind of thing, they're named after just like their, their ways of life. Like, uh, uh, okay, off the top of my head, like there's that, they've got that one rule, there's no trading with some people. Yeah. Like that's just, that's so awesome. I absolutely love that. Yeah, so I think KO are a great example because they've they had a lot of legwork done even quite early on. I think it was one of the first armies that you know there was a there was a hypothesis, and I and much like you, I was a bit salty with the destruction of the old world in the end times, and yeah. uh, I would probably argue that you still could have done a lot of this Age of Sigma stuff in forty in in, in the old world. Um, now I, you know, and now I appreciate it a lot more, and I have a better understanding, and I can see the open space that they've created. But you know, the Carriage and Overlords introduction would have been very very hard because there's a lot of retconning in the old world. But now to have these Dwarden come from the sky because it's now the age of Sigma, not the age of chaos, and they can now start trading with people and they're there as merchants. Uh, although Robert here is uh, saying that his, uh, his army is being developed to deliver baked goods. Um, I'm all down for that narrative. Uh, tell me more about what baked goods you're delivering to the mortal realms and what do I need to trade in regards to those baked goods? <laughs> and I want their comedy names included as well um yeah yeah I, I definitely want to know uh are they delivering like french pastries uh how are they keeping it um warm and things but it, yeah characters characters are fascinating because i guess i guess that's the that's the arc right you know you um you grab onto a character and you follow it through the story you're following but then you've got you know, like whether it's one character or many characters they're the ones that you fall in love with they're the ones that uh i go out and then convert or build on the tabletop you know i think of you know my favorite armies and they're always very character led to a point where 
there's a 3D printing, like a resin printing company, where you can get little uh, name tags for bases where they just kind of wrap oh, around yeah. and I've can get them. them Titanicus, they look awesome. Like they're just awesome, and that just brings back that little bit of customization to the tabletop. Like this is yeah. the name, and you'll see that in the background. I've got named your characters in every army list I submit. I make sure when I use my War Scroll Builder or my app. I make sure that I name each and every character and my characters have a name that are consistent. My free guild general on foot is always character A. My bright wizard is always this character. My hurricane's always this character. And I can continue these stories to life. So um, to a point where I've even written up little battle reports from the, the, the eyes of my characters at the end of a game. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. That's the way to go. It's just enjoyable. Like I, like I remember... Yeah, really? I remember there was a there was a there was a narrative event that I, I went to a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a pure narrative event, so it was like eight. It was match play, but it was uh, it was very narrative focused. And I was writing like I wrote like a one page for each of the rounds, or was it a two page, and and it was like through the eyes of my general, whether it was a win or a loss, and you yeah. know why the decision might have happened, and you know um, even CanCon just passed. Um, the the theme for CanCon was called the Jade Kingdom, so. I had written up a little story about my army being a wizard uh, research party going into the Jade Kingdoms for artifacts. And I found that I, I enjoyed my games at that tournament a lot more uh, than I did without a story. So uh, this is this is really interesting to me, not because I'm an aspiring black black author, a black library author, but I'm 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 learning how to tell better stories on the tabletop, whether it's narratively after the game. Uh, to continue the conversations uh, after yeah, we yeah. play, uh, to bring battles from one to another. It's not just, you know, we're not just playing battle after battle, but there can be a continuing story arc between those battles. Well, you care more about an army if you, you know, start giving them that, that level of detail. I think Crusade, like the, the system of Crusade for 40K is, is awesome. I love, I love the way they've done that. And I really, really hope they do that with AOS 3. Uh, for the record, just to make hundred percent clear, I have absolutely no idea that, uh, what, what what's going to be in Ares three, if and when, you know. But yeah, really and it, you said. everything we're saying here is speculation. When I've said Eldar are getting updates in August, it's just literally yeah. we're making stuff up for example purposes. We're not breaking any NDAs here to tell you that yeah, uh, yeah. Age of Sigma is happening in July and it's going to be these two armies and I uh, have it's, going like, be, it's going to be a populist launch. Uh, yeah, I have like four separate NDAs with GW, so I'm very good at dodging and not actually saying what I know. <laughs> and and right here, perfect example, Shitty Speed Paint says, uh, you know, those characters are wounded uh, and has, have escaped. You know, instead of your Marathi dying in battle, it's just hard to think uh, Marathi just dies. You know, yeah. she gets wounded, she runs off, she's carted away to be, to be healed uh, as opposed to... Literally but dying. Then you like narrative difficulties where characters, because effectively they're a models company, so you can't kill characters. So then you run into like, you know, over 30 years, how many times has like Abaddon dueled one guy and lost, or they've both like gone away? Not because that's what would happen, but that's because kind of what has to happen. So you yeah. have to you have to be very careful with that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I'm probably talking more about my heroes. So yeah, when, yeah, I, cool. when I lose a battle, um, that I, I mean, some of them might die. Like sometimes I, I know a person that gets uh, that's so invested in that they actually will throw the model away and they won't play with that model ever again because they've literally died. So like, good luck to you, sir. Um, but talk to me about the writing process. Talk to me about some of the tools that you use as a writer. Are you... Do you write like, with a notepad? Are you writing with, you know, Microsoft Word? Uh, I know, is it is it, uh, is it George R.R. R. Martin, I think, famously uses a computer with no internet. Uh, I think it might be even like a DOS-based computer, so there's literally no distractions other when he's writing. Talk to me about how do you write and what's your process and, and your tools? Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely undisciplined, so this isn't a case of doing what I do. Uh, you should probably not do what I do. If New York, New York Times bestseller writer. Yes, just, that's true. Yes, but um, stop, stop, stop believing yourself. So tell me about your tools that you use to write. Um, are you familiar with Panic? Um, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm a master of Panic, uh, where you know you just lie awake at night looking up at your ceiling, 
worrying. And then you think, oh, I've had an idea. And then you get up and you go to your office and then you, you start writing and you get about 20 minutes of good writing done. And then you think, I'm really tired. And then you go back to bed and then you start worrying again. And then you have another idea and you go back. And then about two years later, you've got a novel and it's a really healthy, fun process that I recommend to everyone. I call that the burning platform is that if you don't do something, you're going to sink like a little frog on a lily pad. So you've got to keep jumping. Oh, yeah. So, so you, That's you write short bursts as opposed to you sit down for countless hours to punch out a book. Uh, to be honest, I do both. I mean, but I, I sit down for those countless hours, but again, it's, I mean, I will rewrite every sentence three or four times because my brain, I don't have like a healthy way of processing information. And I, I'm not like belittling myself. I mean, like right now, okay, for example, right now, um, I, I can see you and I can see like a tiny me. And my brain right now is just going, Jesus, am I saying something stupid? Oh my God, is the lighting on my camera messing up? Oh God, I hope I haven't said anything dumb so far. Oh my God, have I pissed off Anthony? I watch all his content. I hope he's not uh, annoyed me. I hope that everyone watching is like finding this worthwhile. And it, my, my brain is just doing that constantly, like constantly. Now, I'm freshly therapized to like fight all that nonsense. But my point is like, that's just how my brain works. And that's exactly how my brain works with the story as well. Like when I'm writing, I will be going, oh no, what will, how will this sentence be taken out of context on Reddit? Delete, 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 delete. And then I write it again. And I'm like, oh, no, actually, no, that doesn't flow as well as the first one. And then I'll delete it again. And then I'll rewrite that one again. And so I'm a very, very slow writer. But I do actually have some in, like some useful tools apart from just like vomiting my anxieties on like onto the internet. Uh, I watch a great deal of uh, writer talks, like loads, loads and loads. Writing podcasts, like uh, the talks they give on YouTube. Uh, I, I maybe want up to one a day, like, but just constantly, constantly. And they're not good for ideas, but they are good for like the occasional like flashes of insight to the process where you know they're not good for motivation is what i mean but they are good for the, the moments where something clicks like a few years ago action scenes like the, the question you always get is how do you write action scenes and the, the answer i always give is firstly you, you don't you don't treat them like an action scene it's just every scene is the same thing every scene is a conflict that several characters are resolving and you don't action scenes are a really good example where people think it's one thing and it's not because like there's a fam there's a famous phrase where uh if the if the action is hot you write cold and you don't uh you, you, okay the, the fundamental explanation for if the action is hot you write cold is you're not trying to convince the reader of anything and lord above you're not trying to tell them what happened if you are saying this happened then this happened and this happened it's like cool and cool is like the last thing you want prose to be because stuff exploding and in the cinema, we've all seen bad movies where something can be temporarily exhilarating on a screen uh, just because you, you, know, you get a physical reaction to your heart beating faster, but your brain is still like numb and you're like, this is absolutely moronic. You know, like cool is not, is not what you're looking for. To so basically so Michael Bay's career. I, I don't Just want to cast explosions aspersions. and mega fox, and that's that's your whole career. I don't want to cast a specific aspersions. I'll, I'll but... say it. <laughs> so what what you do is you you kind of dial back from that, and you you're you're just you're not dis layering description after description of events. What you're doing is you're conveying to the reader what happens, and then you're not, uh, and then you trust them. Because what you do is you show your characters reactions to what's happening and you don't go oh and they were really sad about that you know you don't go into that level of specific because you you, you trust them you you know, this happened this was their reaction and if the if the writing's good enough that is uh that their imagination will fill in the blocks and then you punctuate that with uh moments of like quite quite fierce uh quite fierce imagery um, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head. Uh, okay, actually, you know what? The, um, the the start of Soul Hunter. The start of Soul Hunter is you have Talos, who is a Night Lord who suffers from these visions, and uh, he's in his meditation chamber in his armor, and he's just banging his head against the wall. He's just smashing his head against the wall again and again and again. 
Now, the, the, the blunt way of describing that would be like, and he was really sad, and he was really sad about doing this, and the pain was super bad. And it was, you know, and that's, that's cool. You can dress that up in good prose, but it's also absolutely irrelevant. He's, you've got a character who is like this superhuman avatar of war, smashing his head against the wall. You can tell he's in pain because he's doing that. You can tell he's sad because he's doing that. And the reader just, it, it just clicks in their head anyway. And then what you do is you then punctuate that with some, uh, like just, you have to punctuate it with the right sentence. And for example, with Talos, why is he doing that? That was the reason that I wanted to punctuate that scene with. Why is he doing that? And the, the exact sentence is, because it is a curse to be a god's son. You've done your job, then you get the fuck out of that scene. You know that that is how you. I think that. Well, me personally, that that's how I try and write. That's a mic drop. That's a mic drop. He's like, that's, yeah, that, that's that's why you know that's what you're trying to convey. You're not trying to tell them. You're just trying to like. Sometimes just you get confused. Uh, even talking about like what does show not tell mean? Because that means like five hundred different things. But what you're really doing is you're you're not trying to convince the reader of anything you're saying look this is happening this is how the characters react reacting to it i trust you to get it and and then you like hit them with some hopefully like good prose of like you know you punctuate it here and there and that's what it means like if the action is hot right cold like a titan walking over you you don't go oh my god no you don't don't talk about characters weeping and, and that kind of thing because that's not Firstly, it's implied that some something like a titan stepping over you implies that level of awe if you're describing it, in if you're contextualizing it well enough. So you don't need to be that simplistic. And then secondly, it's just, it's also hard to uh, gravitate to characters where you're force-fed what's what they're thinking. Mm. The reader has to make that, you have, the reader has to latch on to what you, you tell them why there might be, you know, what's in their thoughts and why they might be thinking it, but you don't go, they were literally thinking, there's a great line in Futurama where the, the, the robot devil says to Fry, you can't just have your characters announcing their feelings. That makes me feel angry. You know, it's like, that's like the perfect example of like shit writing. Like you, you can't just, you know, that that's like, that's how you, that's what I mean when I say, uh, if the action is hot, you write cold. You get detached, from, you detach yourself from it. You go, this is a fascinating situation. I'm going to trust you to get why it's fascinating and I'll layer in these little punchy hints. And that's, yeah, that's, that's how I write basically. That's how I try. Speaking, anyway. of, speaking of character development, not the, the greatest character ever to be on television is the dog from Futurama in that episode <laughs> where the dog sits outside the pizza shop for mm -hmm. such a long time waiting for its master. I don't care. The dog never said a word yet. I felt everything that dog was feeling as it waited for Fry. So, yeah. uh, and and obviously my, one of my favorite moments as well is the uh, is it G uh, Gary Gygax uh, rolling the dice, going "I am" and rolls a d twenty. Yeah, Pleased yeah. to meet you, like <laughs> and the stitches. Uh, but a couple of really good comments that I wanted to call out was. Um, and I do have a question from Jenny that uh, Jenny's been patiently waiting. I thought was a really good point. And Leviathan has posted this question three times, so I will get to him. <laughs> He's been like constantly, like very, very keen on this answer. Uh, so the uh, the battle of uh, Cal Clay Cal uh, was so awesome for the destruction that happened. Battle oh yeah, and, yeah. No, no fear. That's like Dan's best ever battle, hands down. That's his best ever, and it's so clinical. You know, he wrote that cold. That's a great example of what I mean. Aaron, sorry, uh, the Forge of Mars was saying that uh, your writing teed him up in the, in the middle of a supermarket while listening to an audio book. At first, I, I read that as tearing up. I'm like, oh gosh, you got him so angry, he just ripped down the shelves, and the old Pringles will spill everywhere, and sodas all over the floor. Uh, but Jenny had a really good question. I, I do, I, I did want to call you out on this question, and you mentioned that you know um, you'd listen to some videos uh, at least one a day. Do you have any recommendations on good? talks that you go back to or maybe particular people or particular uh places where you you were finding uh, the most value or at least things that you're currently listening to yes um skillshare i know it's like behind a paywall though but um like skillshare is the best like the best money i think i've spent in terms of having stuff to listen to while i'm doing chores like all the time like, it's just such a well like, i go, i have to go for a walk a lot to just think I need an idea. I need to get out of my office. You know, so uh, yeah, Skillshare is. It has so many good talks from writers. That doesn't necessarily mean that every like hour long talk is 
wall to wall genius. But I do mean like in, in that hour, I will find one or two things that just make me go, yes, that, that's perfect. So, it's those one percenters yeah. that make the difference. It just takes that one idea, that one thing, you're like, I can work with that. I can yeah. I can use that to to get over a, a blocker. Uh, so Skillshare is one that you're you're finding value in. Yeah, there's so many so many talks on there, and um, it's it's quite expensive uh, depending on your budget, but it's it's you know, I found it infinitely worth it. Yeah, investing in time. I always find that you know when I need to get like a creative spark, I actually go to different industries or different topics altogether. I'll go to someone else and. Like I know when I was researching even my YouTube channel, I, I didn't watch a lot of other content creators from Warhammer. I watch beauty bloggers. I watch Twitchers. I watch people that go, right, this is what you're doing. How does that relate to me? What's the lesson in here? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it sparks an idea that, that you can do. So I find also, like, I think this kind of goes back to your point about not being a 40K player, is that if you immerse yourself in chefs, any, any professional chef will know this, they don't go home and cook. Like cooking at home is the last thing a professional chef wants to do because they, they're cooking all day. Um, they're the worst. So having that kind of relaxation home or that, you know, um, that, that holiday house, yeah. you play Age of Sigma, you write 40K. And I think I having mean, this. That's definitely part of it. Uh, but the other part is that just most of my friends prefer AOS. <laughs> so. That's on record, guys. Record. And Night Lord Leviathan has been busting my chops to ask this question. He, they've said a friend of mine told us to write the story I wanted to write when I told him that I wasn't sh uh, sure of the other people's opinion. Uh, it echoed to me as important point. Um, have you always loved your stories? <laughs> That's an excellent question that has like a two part answer. Um, no, but that's because I hate my own work. And I don't mean that in like this weirdly false, modest way. It's just like, Imagine you wrote like a love letter to a girl, right, in high school, and then it was read out in assembly. Like that's how that's how I, I've listened to like maybe twenty seconds of like one of my audiobooks, and I was just like off, 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 you know, because it was it's the 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 feeling is indescribably horrible. And again, this is probably something I should bring up with my therapist. And I'm, I'm sure I will when I get down the line. But yeah, so it's, I don't like my own work, however. I do write the kind of stories I like to read. Like again, this ties into the, what I was saying about historical fiction and, and how I approach characterization. Um, so yes, but also no. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. And and I hate listening to my voice. So editing is the most painful part of my creative yeah, process yeah. because I hate I hate my voice. And I'm like, oh, do I really sound like that? And luckily for me, when I was uh, a young adult, I one of my first jobs was uh, I was a radio DJ. So I would uh, I would I would be the the guy from your drive home from six till nine. I would, oh, yeah. uh, I, would I, I would do that. I'd play all the the songs and I would you know talk between the breaks and all that. But you hear your voice constantly and you just it it, it drives you insane. So you're like, oh, people listen to me. Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you're right. Like you know, d d write. Uh, or create the things that you would like to create, and the people people like people people like people who are like themselves. And and mm -hmm. if people like if people like what I write, they're they're my type of tribe. Yeah, so yeah. I, think, I think that's that's a really good way to uh, to approach and things. Actually, there's kind of a third branch to that question as well, because again, that's it comes down to what we were saying earlier about choosing um, what you're choosing to write about because I don't necessarily choose to write about my favorite stuff. Um, and I know Chris writes the same, like he just writes about stuff that he's interested in at that time. Um, yeah, so yeah, write, write what you love, but be aware that that's not always the, the, the only way. And also that if you, know, you might be one of those writers who wants your publisher to be saying, hey, could you do something like this, please? So you talked about a little, you haven't quite answered my original question, which was about what tools you use. So you mentioned that you use things like Skillshare and mm. uh, like writer's block to, uh, and things like that. But what other, what other tools do you use? I, um, I know when I was writing a book, so I was, I was writing a book at one point, um, I would use things like my phone dictations and I had an oh, idea. I'm with you. Yeah. No, 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 no. Like, that's obviously a very interpretive question. Mm. Um, 
So I know like I'd use my phone to dictate or I'd use my phone even as a content creator. I will, if I've got an idea, I would even just like to, to put a bullet point in my notes section and I would, might expand upon it later or I might come to the idea in 12 months or 24 months. I just create like a log. Um, I know some writers will have like a little book next to them. So when they're, uh, when they go to bed, so if they have an idea, you know, in their sleep, they'll write it down as quick as possible. So usually will forget it, but Talk to me about that that part of your your creativity. Do you do you do that? Do you use? Uh, yeah, like um, my memory is terrible. I mean, I do mean like almost clinically terrible. Like I could tell you Phoenix Sun stats from the nineties, and I could tell you anything about Warhammer. But you, you know, you ask me what happened two days ago in my family, I'd be like. Mm. And it's, you know, that, so when it comes to making notes, yeah, I'm, I'm a, like quite an intensive note taker. The problem is, however, my notes are, I store my iPad under my pillow when I sleep, which is, I think that's dangerous because they explode or something. But anyway, I can like just literally under your pillow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't bend? Like, my head doesn't weigh that much, man. It's just, <laughs> all right, all right, I got a big head. <laughs> no, so I, can, I get that out like quickly and I've got, I've got my notes app on that. But the problem is, like, you don't always understand what the hell you were talking about the next day. And I get that so much where I think I've had some genius idea. And I'm like, yes, I've solved I've solved this problem with whatever the hell I'm writing. And I'll like, sit down and I'll get my iPad out. And I'll be like, what is this nonsense gibbering? And it's, it's so frustrating. I've, I've forgotten some of the best ideas I've ever had. I'm sure of it. But yes, take, all right, take, take notes um because well mine specifically are almost always notes about something that would make a, a scene more believable or credible or relatable like something that a character thinks or does in the scene that you know would realistically happen or they solve a narrative like hole that i've fallen into so my notes are always like super important and i forget so so many of them so many of them do you, because uh, I know I'll do things, especially like I'll take my dog for a walk or I'm really fortunate to live near, you know, a national park. So I've got some really nice walks around me. Uh, and sometimes I'll go for a long walk and, you know, get the ideas brewing or even like, uh, you know, in the shower, some of your greatest ideas come from the shower. You get those little light bulb moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, and I'll dictate to myself. I'll get like a little audio recorder and I'll talk to myself and write down notes as well. Do you find tools like that are helpful? Uh, yes, but I have to be careful because although we live in the middle of nowhere, uh, um, when, whenever I go for a walk and I'm talking to myself or I'm singing to myself, like there's always some fucking farmer nearby who will like hear me singing dwarf songs from Lord of the Rings. I'm like, oh God, this is so embarrassing. Or they'll hear me like talking about, and then the war master of chaos should do X, Y, Z into my phone you know, and think, he must think I'm absolutely insane or or Christ knows what. Yeah, so I, I yeah, I, I, I make dictation notes as well. And yeah, to, to be honest, like my process is really simple. I, I tried to get into Scrivener at one point because so many of my friends swore by it. And I understand that like every professional uses Scrivener. But like Word's quite good now. Microsoft Word is like, it's quite good. It's not like it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's like quite a good program. So it does it does what I need it to do. Although to be fair, we did lose Paperclip, and Paperclip uh, Clippy was uh, pretty amazing back in the day. But I know even because um, I know again, like being a corporate shill that I am, um, I go through almost all these like productivity training and understanding and all that type yeah, of yeah. stuff. And I know for me, one of the big things has always been um, an interruption. For example, um, it can take you up to twenty-seven minutes to get back into flow or get back into a rhythm that you were in before a distraction. So, you know, turning things off like my notifications, my, my email, for example, Outlook doesn't give me a notification to tell me when I have a new email. I even slow down the refreshment of my emails to be every 20 minutes. So I'm constantly not being distracted by quickly looking at Facebook to see what new notifications or Twitter or, you know, like being in that zone and being in there as long as possible. That's um, very healthy. The, the problem is my eight-year-old son is on Discord now. So <laughs> he's constantly messaging me about whatever he's doing in Minecraft or, or whatever. And I get one of the problems, you know, when you've got young kids is you just have to, in a perfect world, it would be wondrous to be isolated perfectly, but you just have to 
I, my main fear, like, is you know, he'll grow up and he'll be like, my dad just had no time for me. He was always writing about fucking space war. You know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at Laura's comment. She's like, um, uh, "Are you more concerned the farmers will steal your ideas?" I'm pretty sure one of the farmers around you might be contributing to spiky bits or uh, Lady Atia. So uh, that might also be why you don't like speaking out aloud. I don't think they're big Warhammer guys, but I'll be sure to ask them next time. Like <laughs> when they're shearing their sheep. <laughs> Hello, are you guys into Warhammer? And they'll be like, "What are you?" Doing? Who are you, you English cunt? <laughs> I did say you could swear, and I just said the first not five, ten minutes, and uh, I'm Beep. sure you advertisers wouldn't have noticed the, the C word. I apologize. Oh, that's fine. I don't care. Australia's every second word is C. Like the amount of, I'm surprised it's taken me three years on this channel. I think that's the first C word that's been dropped. Oh, no. What a terrible. No, honor. it's fine. As an Australian, like that means that we're good mates. Um, <laughs> so that's all good. Like it, it, we're in the good books. Um, Maybe a couple more questions just quickly around um, around the writing process. So you mentioned being a family man and uh, you have some children, especially right now, which is obviously you got your kids in your household more than uh, more than they normally would. How do you balance the, the I guess like how do you balance your commitments at work? You know, getting that that at least for me, I need concentration. I need quiet. I need you know, to, to be not broken in concentration. How do you balance your, your work and life commitments right now as an author, now that your kids are probably at home more than they normally would? Um, no. Any advice? Um, get married. <laughs> um, the best, I mean, the thing is like, Kathy does a lot of heavy lifting in uh, where that's concerned because she she's already got her own stuff that she's got to do. And then she's she's mostly doing she's homeschooling the kids while uh while covid's going on and yeah so she does a lot of the heavy lifting there because she understands that obviously i need to be isolated for 15 hours a day you know do, writing about space war um but even then like shakes is always on discord like hey daddy do you want to come in and see me do just dance it's like i kind of do but i also need to you know uh write my siege of terror novel <laughs> etc so yeah, uh, I don't have a good. I don't have a good balance there, to be honest. I, I'm not very good at advice on that score, apart from get married and have an extremely patient wife, like I do. Uh, or night lords that said don't have kids. So uh, I think I think that's another option. I think the fact that you've already got them, so uh, do the best. And I think like right now, it's it's awesome that we're able to spend more time with our kids. It's like you know, no time in history have we had this flexibility. So take yeah, advantage. Yeah. But then there's also the how do you balance it and. Um, it's certainly a challenge. Um, you know, shout out to those people who are also playing teacher and um, just all that yeah. stuff. Um, guys are doing the crazy stuff. At, at what point do themes start coming into your stories? Do you, you know, obviously we start building characters, but what about like story themes? Are they, do they kind of emerge as you're writing or is that something you're like at the, at the, the planning phase? I know, I know when I write about these two characters and I want, these milestones to happen in the book or i want this outcome to occur like how does how does themes and how does that kind of happen between your books that's a really really good and difficult question um quite early on i think but inevitably you'll start to find the others showing up that you obviously did, you don't necessarily expect and then you're like oh that's how you uh how you yeah you, you end up defining whole arcs by a theme you discovered later on but but quite early to be honest um like spear of the emperor like the the, the conceit between uh, behind spear of the emperor was the theme is what is it like to be a human around space marines and obviously this is a chapter surf uh so that's a very privileged position obviously that comes with its own you know lifestyle let's say um and she's a mentor legion surf so obviously they have extremely tooled up and rare chapter surf so she's in a very different position from your baseline human where she's still human so my point was the theme of that book is what is it like to be around space marines like what does it feel like how do they act you know what is it like to be around these angelic but also barbaric effectively like transhuman monsters like post-human monsters and 
I just I just loved that idea. I thought that was just such a good idea for for a novel. So that was like the central theme of that book. And then the one that came over uh, that came while I was writing it. Uh, and this honestly, this came from talking to a lot of veterans, and uh, it was just it resonated with me really hard as I was writing it. Uh, like identity, like a soldier's identity. Uh, without spoilers, at some point uh, in the book, you have the the, the main character, the Space Marine main character, uh, looking at himself in the mirror, and he's trying to, he, he, for various reasons that I won't go into, he's having a, a, a crisis of identity. Um, the, the, the short, unspoiled version is that he's learned how, uh, learned about the hypocrisy in the Inquisition, and how they are not respecting the autonomy of the Adeptus Astartes, and how his own chapter might have uh, deceived him and worked with the Inquisition. And he's trying to process that. Like, if you are a weapon, if you have been psycho indoctrinated and hypno indoctrinated and trained from childhood to be a weapon, and you've been a weapon for like a hundred years of your life, what happens like when the hand that wields you, you, you can't trust that hand anymore? Like, what does that do to you? Like, what does that do to your identity? And then also, like, because of his uh, various points in the story, because of his injuries, again, this comes back to the looking himself in the mirror. It's like, the face he has presented to the galaxy is his faceplate, his helmet's faceplate. So that's the face that he interacts with the Imperium with. That's the face that he interacts with his enemies with. That's the face that that's is that him? Mm -hmm. Or then when he's looking in the mirror with oh so is he his faceplate or is he his face? Because he's more familiar with his faceplate. And that, that, that that's the kind of in uh, like so, you know, that's the kind of thing the soldiers have to ask themselves if they've if they've been deployed for, you know, what, it's the kind of question of Vietnam veterans who go back for a second tour, like they, that's what they ask themselves, you know, and that's that's I think that's the key to characterization as, as well as themes, you know, because the, the, they're they're people. Mm. Every character is a person, even like space marines who have been through all of this stuff to iron out their humanity. the The process isn't perfect. If the process was perfect, they would never fall to chaos. They would never be tempted to fall to chaos. They would they would be the perfect weapons, but they're not. The process is imperfect because it's Warhammer. Nothing is perfect in Warhammer. So yeah, like that's that's the, the kind of I think it's probably the best example of a. I mean, and the, the Black Legion series as well has has that in spades. The whole point of that is when everyone in the galaxy hates you, and you hate them, who can you trust? You know, and that's that's why the Black Legion's formed. It's because they're, they're, they're the Primarch Fathers let them down and failed miserably. Then all the other traitor legions are like wailing on them because the Sons of Horus were the biggest failures. And so like the dregs and the outcasts from all the other legions, uh, the, 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 the really ruthlessly competent ones who had managed to survive all the other purges band together and that's it. You, you make your own brotherhood. It's like the idea of a found family. Like that's, mm -hmm. that, that's why the Black Legion exists. And the point of the stat series is to convey why, like the, the ties between the characters in that legion. I think if I if I think about like my my Stormcast my Sigmar equivalent, you know, it's, it's story that I'm really fascinated to to learn is you know for anyone who who knows Stormcast law, um, every time a Stormcast Eternal dies, their their soul is reforged. Yeah, but yeah. every time that they are reforged, they lose more and more of themselves, and I guess they become more. I guess almost probably space marine or maybe even worse than a space marine yeah, yeah. and i wonder you know will there be a uh, a chapter a team some type of stormcast army that's been reforged so much because they've been in so many wars yeah. that they are literally like a killing robot or they probably are on the fence of like inquisition or even chaos and yeah. they are like they're just got no personality and you know are they doing the right thing still and i think it's that inner conflict or that uh morally conflicting stories that make those characters three-dimensional as opposed to just being these one dimensional characters that are just predictable and um they have no opportunity to surprise and delight yeah yeah and stormcast are a really good example actually because i think oh, i might be in hammer hall i'm not sure but in one of the in one of the cities or is it a living city? Whatever. In one of the cities, you have like stormcasts that are starting to treat criminals mm. like chaos. You know, it's like because they're, they're, they've been reforged so many times and they're so ardent about order and they're so ardent about, you know, law. And so they're starting to, you know, they're starting to just treat criminals as if they were 
uh, you know, like chaos worshippers. And I just I love that because not necessarily just because that action uh, is interesting, although that is interesting on its own. But then what do you have like the other people in those chambers, like the other Stormcast in those chambers? What if you see one of your friends going that way? You know, someone who you fought at their side for decades and they're like, you can trust them implicitly. And now you kind of can't because they're going off the rails. And then what, what what are they thinking as they're going off the rails? Like, and they're like, well, you're, you know, they think you'd be going soft because you're not, uh, you're not seeing as pure and as clearly as they are. Like that kind of conflict. That's just that's gold. Yeah, so, even uh, even like in the cities of Sigma, like some people don't see the Stormcast as the savior. Like the average yeah. human, they just think like there's like the glory hogs. They're like a, you know, they they come to save the day. We don't need them. So they're actually they're seen as a, a protagonist rather than the mm-hmm. savior. Um, and th- this question from Matt was a really interesting one because it kind of, it's not just what Matt said here, but I-, I did read it in your AMA as well. And I know people have asked about revisiting stories and, uh, I know, you, you know, very successful with the, the Night Lord series, uh, obviously Horace Heresy is kind of cooling down a little bit. Um, are you sad that these kind of stories come to an end? I know with the Horace Heresy, you, you were kind of a bit hesitant to go back into a story that you've kind of already told um yeah. is there any other stories you think you know um in some of these series and it doesn't necessarily have to be her- heresy but you know like with, with heresy for example or even any of the stories like how do you see going back into stories or you know revisiting to tell new stories or how do you feel uh, about that? the heresy is a uh, a difficult thing in in a way because <clears throat> uh in some ways what i think i mean is, is completely irrelevant because it, it makes so much money that um, I mean, I, to me, I don't know what will happen with the heresy when once the Siege of Terror series is finished. Uh, and even if I did, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to say. But there's so it's 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 like uh, it's is that you know it's 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 the heresy. It's the freaking Horus heresy. So. I'm 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 sure that there's always going to be interest in it in one way or another. However, <clears throat> a couple of us have always argued for a shorter heresy series rather than a longer one, um, and a shorter siege series rather than a longer one. I mean, even eight books. Uh, me and another author who I won't say, we were like, should be five. It should be five books. And uh, yeah, so I've always, I've always advocated shorter, punchier, to the focus on. The, the core bits so the heresy the heresy is strange i, I there, there's always going to be stories to tell there but my point okay my overarching point is i think there's a tendency at times for people to just only read the heresy or only like the heresy and i find that kind of sad in a way it's like liking star wars but only liking the republic era you know, it's like that's it's cool, it's great, or it's like liking ancient history and not liking the Roman Empire, but only liking the Battle of Troy. Mm. You know, it's like the 40k is so insane, and it just the way the way the Imperium functions is so absolutely, it's just so impossibly vast and archaic, and, and you know, it's just it's so it's so mad and it's so beautiful, and. I think it's a shame when some people are like, oh yeah, no, it's just it's just smaller. Everything was bigger and cooler in the heresy. It's like the decay is the point. The decadence, the decay, the erosion, the rot. That's that's rad. That is cool as hell. Like that's why that's why 40k is cool. And so when I mean, people are just like, oh, I just like I like the heresy because all the Primarchs were around and, and blah blah blah. So it's like that they are great. They're awesome. But I want I want 40k to get the kind of love and respect that the heresy just gets just by existing like mm. the heresy gets it gets a lot of easy love and I, I think that's i think that's kind of unfair i think that, that, in, that interests me as well because uh i guess sigma is about to get their own version of heresy so we're going back to the old world um you know in the next couple of years so i you know and, and we're going to tell new stories i think people are, are not going to get warhammer fantasy battles 8th edition that five minutes till midnight uh you know time of you know carl franz and and things like that we're going to go back potentially up to the timeline of the great war against chaos so it's new stories new characters new lands new provinces new uh stories um 
And for me, I think the lessons from heresy are going to be brought into the old world. So it's fascinating to hear um, this take and and just some of these things because you're right. Like, it, you know, even the old world gets easy love. People just like yeah, you know anything. Yeah. The old world is like, oh my god, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Mm. Um, and it's almost like I, I know in my conversations, I've been trying to curb enthusiasm to go, guys, we don't know what's coming. Just yeah. like. It's not re-releasing 8th edition. It's not the timeline that you know. And um, not letting expectations ruin what's about to happen or what should happen. Yeah. Be there and be a part of the journey and the story. Yep. Uh, question from uh, Chris as well was, uh, do you think with short fiction, uh, do you think it helps uh, you to learn uh, to control your writing for larger projects? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, um, shorter fiction is the place where you can do crazy stuff. Uh, it hasn't it hasn't given me any discipline or, or self control at all. Uh, no, it's just a great place to do that kind of esoteric stuff that you might not get away with in a novel. Um, yeah, so no, <laughs> no, no. What's it like writing with a couple of authors? Because I imagine. Um... Because in some of your some of your books, it's not just been you; it's been you know a dual book, or you've written you know with multiple writers. What's it like writing with, I guess, multiple authors? Is it confusing? Is it challenging? Because you're all conflicting with ideas. Do you need to find like a central point that you're all kind of work and you're on the same page? Like, how does that? How is that kind of for you? Is that um, is it easy to manage? Yeah. I haven't really I haven't done it with novels exactly. Uh, although there's an asterisk there that we'll get back to. Uh, when you do that with RPG books, it's, it's it's kind of easy, to be honest, because they're divided up into chapters. So it's like, you do this chapter, you do that chapter, you do that chapter. And you, you guys, you talk as you're doing it, but the chapters are almost completely distinct. Like someone's doing rules, so that doesn't affect you doing the backstory of this faction. And then the person doing the the, the current society of the faction doesn't really that you know, affect. So it's, it's quite divided up on RPG stuff. Uh, in terms of novels, when you're working on a big team, uh, ooh, it's we talk about how we're all friends on on the Horus Harris team, and we are. But there have been there there there, there of course there have been moments where everyone's or where you know someone's like feels like they didn't get X, you know, when they felt like they wanted it, or you've had to surrender Y, or someone's done something in a book, um, and you were like, I was going to do that, you know, like. Mm -hmm. That, of course, of course, that happens. But ex, uh, experience and getting on with the people you work with goes goes a very long way. Like the siege team, I, I know they've all said it long like before me, but it's, it's it remains true that the siege of terror team is so like there is in terms of like the way we talk to each other, there is no fat left on on that body. Like we just everyone's there and we're, we're focused and we we talk about we're, we're completely open with each other no there's no ego at that table there's no feelings no one's feelings are going to get hurt we, we bend over backwards for each other you know if someone wants something it's not like well i kind of want it it's like yeah do it and this is how i will set it up for you to do it you know uh and that's happening right like right now um and i obviously can't give specifics on what what i'm writing but there's a lot of okay this just happened in your book and I'll, I'll carry that on, or can you set it up in, you know, for me to carry on, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess that kind of comes into like the question that um, Leviathan also asked was around, you know, it's it's more than just managing a project. It's writing styles. It's you know setting up the the you know the way that you even see the world. So I guess uh, like any good university group project, you all need to be on the same page. You need to divide the work. The planning process is probably more important. Than oh, probably yeah. ever before uh otherwise it just leads up to disappointment yeah yeah um we've been really good at i say really good you know we're, we're, history will judge us on that but we've been uh really open with each other on on, on every possible level um so it's it's, it's in terms of communication, we are as open as we could possibly be, which narrows down a lot of the problems. Like that just soars off any ego trouble. And, and ego trouble is like a huge thing. You know, every writer is an insecure asshole looking for vindication, looking for validation. 
and often vindication. So, you know, just uh, eliminating that from the table is, is, is a huge deal. Like you can't over exaggerate. You, you can't exaggerate how important that is. But when it comes to writing styles, like having different styles is kind of the point. As long as you're all telling the same vibe, again, it's like 40K, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling, you know? As long as you're all telling the same feeling. Um, like Mortis, uh, I think Mortis is coming out next. Um, John's prose in Mortis is, is completely different from uh, Chris Rates and from Guy's and Gav's and Dan's and mine. But it, it doesn't matter because we're all telling the same, you know, r- roughly the same vibe. It's a feature, not a bug. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You're all singing from the same hymn sheet. You know, it doesn't have to mean that you all sing in the same um, tone, but yeah, yeah. you're all on the same page. And I guess much like a song with the various tones, you've got a wonderful melody uh, that comes out. But uh, I'm going to start moving towards our final questions. I know it's starting to get a little bit late for you. And I'd like just some recommendations and some maybe some, uh, if I was aspiring to be a published author, whether it was with Black Library, whether it was be uh, my my favourite uh, RPG company or, you know, any type of, you know, turning writing as a legit profession. Uh, mm-hmm. Before I get into those last final questions, uh, Matt was asking from a lighter note, has, uh, has the Witcher Henry uh, Cavell reached out? Uh, Cavill, uh, has he reached out and uh, after the shout out that you uh, gave in the interview? So I know Midwinter Minties, Minties, Midwinter Minis tried to get like a charity game. I don't know if that's ever gotten anywhere, but has he reached out okay. to you? Now, okay when, the, okay, when that broke out, right, I was dead silent for days. I stayed off social media because it was I was getting hammered with it, right? And I... Yeah. I was in a men- I was in a place, mentally speaking, where I wasn't doing wonderfully, right? So my all I could see was that it was probably a typo and like maybe they meant Dan or you know Chris or something or like the because the interviewer probably wasn't familiar with 40k, so it, it might not have been me. And then after a few weeks, I was like, you know what? Maybe they, maybe he does like my work. Maybe that maybe the, it wasn't a typo. And, uh, but I still didn't want to say anything publicly. And I still haven't, like, to this, it's like two years later or something, or a year, and I still haven't said anything. But after weeks and weeks, what I did is this is so pure cringe. But I was like taking it as a step towards, like, you know what? Just grow up, Aaron. Just grow up. Reach out. So I messaged him on Instagram, right? And it was the, the one, it was my first Instagram message that I've ever sent. I was like, hey, uh, caught the mention in, you know, that, that's doing social media rounds lately. Uh, if you ever want to throw some dice in the Arenorium, you're, you're totally welcome. Uh, thanks for saying that. It came at a really cool. Uh, it came at a really cool moment. I was like, not in a great place, and that that cheered me up. Thanks very much, sincerely, Aaron. And then the problem is, it's Henry Cavill, so he gets 16 bajillion messages every hour. I mean, I, I, I am like, I'm no one. I am like a Z list celebrity, and I get, I get dozens and dozens of messages a day, just in my inboxes, not in, not counting the actual social media stuff. And I, there's, there are so many that are people that you're not, you know, you're not friends with or you know linked with or whatever that you just they, they blur, and you don't you don't see plenty of them. And that's me. Now, so his inbox would just be, just hammer fucked with with <laughs> contact. So. He either never saw it, which is perfectly likely, uh, or he saw it and was like, no, it was a typo. I love Dan, actually. So, and then just didn't want to hurt my feelings. So, no. It's the, it's the answer. I will say there's a third third possibility, and probably the more likely story, is that uh, a lot of, again, I know this from my corporate, my corporate musing uh, and working with, like, CEOs and CFOs, is they often have someone, multiple people working their social media. So yeah. while they might be the one who tweets, they probably have a, ma- a social media manager responding to remove that noise from their handles and maybe only recommend the two to three or the ones that actually should respond. So uh, maybe it was intercepted by a social media manager. Um, yeah, no, let's cushion so. my 
bruised ego with that. No, no, like it's legit. Like it's legit, and uh, and I've worked with salespeople to get around those EAs and PAs to get in front of their CEO or CFO or CIO. So uh, I know it's legitimate. And if I if I was big time, like you know, like Henry, I would have someone managing because you're right. Like I would just get smashed constantly by. Uh, so anyone that can like remove the noise, remove the dick pics, all that weird stuff that would get smashed at all the different social media channels, um, I would certainly pay good money to remove that. Absolutely. That's not an invitation, guys, for dick pics. Please don't send me anything. I've had a, I've had a few of those, let me tell you. I have yeah. not. Oh, I have you. not. I've had some interesting requests to when to make people tell me that their wives love me, uh, but there's no <laughs> some, some conversations I haven't after that. But no, no reflections to the penis. Please don't. Please don't. Um, <laughs> I'll follow you all the ones I've got. <laughs> my friend, my friend sends enough of the the meme guy. I don't know his name. The, 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 the uh, there's some meme guy that's like anyway. Let's put this back on track. Um, if I was aspiring black writer, uh, black black library author or a, you know someone who's aspiring to be a writer uh, and being mm -hmm. as my primary profession do you have any advice uh that you would recommend to me on on getting that break uh making it a profession um anything that either helped you um or even help people that have now joined the black library team um uh you know recently or you know uh some things that you've have some maybe some common themes that have worked on on the acceptance criteria and i guess any any advice yeah um oh actually hang on i i, I prepared i i, I, I uh because so I, I, I guess imagine the way that you got into black library that that path is probably a lot harder uh now than it was 10 years ago Yes. Uh, I guess that, I guess like people who learn the lesson, like oh well, Aaron Aaron just got an email and he got an he got an interview, might not be the way. Yeah. They're not promoting as well. Like please don't harass people on on Aaron to get an introduction, because uh, again, that, <laughs> like that's not what we're asking. Like there's now a formal process, so let's help people get that 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 uh the best opportunity. And before you respond, uh, only fans win. I wouldn't inflict that on the world. Good <laughs> no. Lord. <laughs> I, I, although, although I have threatened at times, uh, beard. Uh, I was going to do like thunder down under battle tome reviews. So like I'll do like only fan naked battle tome reviews. I'm sure there's a a very small niche market where people want that. <laughs> Sold. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> so please continue. Like give now and let's bring us back on track. What's the advice that you'd give me as a uh, aspiring author? I just remembered. You know, this probably wouldn't would have been much more useful to have remembered three hours ago but i i messaged uh two of the editors yesterday i messaged uh kate and hannah who i talked to a fair bit i was like oh i'm doing like my first interview in a squillion years tomorrow um and i'm sure like the how do you get published for black library questions will come up and i said what would you like authors to say i was like i'll put I'll, you know I'll, I'll say all my stuff but what, what would you like authors to say if you had the chance and they you know they sent me back some stuff. So, right, yes. <clears throat> um, this, yeah, okay, right. Uh, what, what would you recommend people doing to become a Black Library author? Now we're going to get into my bedtime story voice. Read beyond Black Library classics. Oh, sorry, read beyond Black Library. Classics, contemporary, and nonfiction. It's all useful and good inspiration. Study narrative craft, write every day. Find like-minded people who can give you constructive criticism. And likewise, you'll learn so much from reading and doing the same to their work. That is, it, that's, that's brilliant because I, I, get, I get so much traction from sending my stuff to, uh, to my friends and other authors that I work with um, because they have like, no, they, they will not be gentle if, if something's not working. Um, and I'm not, I'm not particularly gentle with them. Like we had this long, like long conversation with John, for example, when he was writing Praetorian of Dawn and he was like, you know, we were talking about the ending and I was like, you should kill Altharius. He was like, mm. I said, no, no, you should kill Altharius, kill him. And then, you know, that, that was, that ended up being the climax of the book and like that kind of thing. I, I've had equally, um, 
I've had worse, worse narrative holes. Like they're they're not like major moments for me. They're just points where the book just grinds to a halt narratively. And I'm like, Chris, you know, Nick, John, someone help me. Or far more commonly, I will send chapters one and two to my friends and say, is this trash? Like if it is the shit, should I start over? And they'll be like, This is good, but like lose this, or it's fine, you're worrying about nothing. Like you 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 cannot uh, get a better tool than an honest group of alpha slash beta readers. Um, <clears throat> here's another question. Okay. Uh, how would you recommend taking on characters who aren't human, but making them relatable? What a deep question. Uh, uh, this is a really cool and complex question, which probably has a million different answers. And it's something we talk about a lot internally. I think it boils down to considering the ins and outs of the faction, society, and culture. And in doing so, trying not to project our own real world ideals and norms onto that. But in saying that, there are relatable experiences that transcend race. Uh, survival, kinship, betrayal, love, whether it be for another person, a twisted love for the dark gods you worship, or even the way your green little heart races at the sight of that shiny red death killer war truck. So, I mean, we touched on that a lot earlier about how mm. people are people, you know. Um, how do I get my submission to Black Library uh, accepted? Uh, practice. Don't just write for the open submissions window. Write all year, then rewrite those stories, then rewrite them again. Even if the pitch, this is the crucial part, okay? Even if the pitch isn't always what we're after, if the writing sample impresses us, we're more than likely to approach the author. So I, I see a tremendous amount of anxiety online when it comes to the open submissions window where people are like, well, what if my stories, you know, what, what if they don't like this story? You know, have I blown my chance? So no, uh, you, you, you haven't. If, you're, if your writing's good, you'll always, you'll always get noticed. Uh, and the last one is what are some of the common fit pitfalls that would be authors who want to write within someone else's IP like Warhammer fall into? Uh, trying to reinvent the wheel from the offset or wanting to tackle iconic big scale events or characters, which is awesome to see their passion for the setting. Uh, but when we choose to explore those highly popular big ticket items, we're very mindful about pairing them with an author who has the right experience and creative flair to suit them. And again, that ties into like sometimes they will approach you for something they specifically want. Uh, or, or if you you're pitching, they'll be like, yeah, you could you could pull this off. We trust you. Off you go. So, yeah, I think that that kind of covers the that definitely covers the ones I always get on Twitter. You know about the the, the submissions window. It's interesting you say that because uh, first off, thank you for sharing that. Because I imagine there's a lot of people uh, who who have at least submitted or wanted to submit in that Black Library uh, deadline, and either they haven't been confident enough to submit. Um, yeah or they, uh, they have been submitted before and they've got their, that rejection. And rejection is probably a lot of the, the authoring process is ideas that you think are wonderful aren't always necessarily great. And the peer reviews, I'm a part of a few think, uh, think tanks, you know, just, you know, subject matter experts or people who are in the same kind of field as me. And we share ideas, we collaborate, we constructively challenge. We, you know, I always believe that there's no such thing as failure. There's only feedback. And sharing those books around, those stories, those uh, characters, uh, to get people you trust and respect to challenge your, um, to challenge you and constructively challenge you. Just because they challenge you doesn't make it right, but it makes you think about yeah. the decisions you've made. Sorry. And you can double down and go, no, 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 I know this is important for this reason. Or they go, oh, you know what? You might have something in that. Maybe I should write an alternative ending and explore how that kind of works and then compare the two. Yeah. Um, I think it's just that constructive and creativity refinement process so that when you come to Black Library, you have the best version of what you can submit Yep. And I like the fact that you pointed out, like, don't just write about the big, the soul war. Don't write about the siege of terror. Don't write about these big events, or these big characters, because that's not what they're looking for. They want to see that you can tell a comparing story, that you can create a character and make you like them or hate them, yep. uh, that you're able to uh, understand the world and articulate it in a, in a way that's descriptive and interesting. Um yep. 
I imagine that's like, like I, I almost work backwards. I, I, it reminds me of a job interview. The job interview doesn't, they, they, they want to see what I've done and how yeah. it relates to what they are looking for as opposed to this is what I've done in the past. Yeah, no, that's that's the thing. They want to see what your writing's like when a famous event isn't doing the heavy lifting for you. And that's, you know, that's that's a good way to write in general, you know, like as uh, as great as some of the heresy events are, the, their sheer famous, like their sheer famousness and their sheer grandeur sometimes does some of the heavy lifting, you know. Um, and you, you don't, don't get me wrong, you appreciate that when you're writing it and it comes with its own challenges. But uh, yeah, like the small scale isn't like a failure. It's not a failure of ambition. Small scale is often where the best stuff is, you know. It would be the easiest thing in the world to write a series about Abaddon in Abaddon's head. But uh, I, fuck that. I wanted to write about Chaos Marines in the in the formation of Abaddon's Legion, you know? Like, what's it like to live in the Eye of Terror? I care about that. I don't care about what Abaddon's thinking. Yeah. So, yeah and a, and Abaddon is such a, a big, big character already that I don't need to get into the weeds of... of you know what he had for breakfast but yeah, yeah I, i'm absolutely obsessed with you know tell me about the guardsman who's on defending the line as uh the gene stealers uh are just like uh, this like there's a, a, a horde of tyranids about to approach uh a guy with a las gun tell me about uh the mortal realms with the city of sigma that's on the forest of the sylvaneth and they don't know if Alariel super pissed and is she good Alariel or is she cut sick? Because that's a that's a very interesting relationship that Alariel being the goddess of life, yeah. I'm sure she doesn't appreciate me cutting down a forest to build my city. So am I getting happy Alariel or am I getting stop cutting down my trees, you jerk, and uh, I'm going to you know pimp slap you? Even more interesting, just before we go there, even more interesting I think is what do the specific leaders of that grove think you know like one why do they think that and what interactions have they had with your settlement in the past that you maybe don't know about and that would throw a fork in it like that that's where the stories are you know like and me, spoiler yeah. alert, that guardsman dies yes uh, yeah you know um how do you handle rejection uh and we are very close to wrapping up guys we've got a couple more questions but uh i do i don't i don't want to you know if i if i get rejected from Black Library, and that probably happens to most people. Um, so knowing that you're not just like the you know special snow, snowflake, most people probably get rejected. Um, mm. how, how how do you handle rejection when you get turned away from an idea, or if you were building up such a big milestone, such as a Black Library submission, and you get the the sorry you are unsuccessful or not this time? Yeah, yeah. There's um there's degrees of projection, I guess. And you have to, you have to be honest with yourself why you re re were rejected. Um, for example, it could just be, uh, I, I, again, I'm NDA on this one, so I can't say too much, but there was a certain project that me and a, a couple of the others were, were it was, we, we'd driven it and we'd come up with it. And we were like, we really, really want to do this. And, um, we were, completely braced for them to say no is you know, it was it's very it's quite ambitious and we were like braced for rejection but then we would have known the rejection wasn't they didn't think we could handle it it would have just been like corporate reasons like that it would, didn't work with the release schedule or they didn't want to tell that story or it would have like pulled focus from other stuff you know so but yeah in terms of rejection of part honestly this is this isn't an arrogance thing this is a luck thing because I write so slowly, I'm not pitching much, so I, I, I don't I don't get rejected much because I I'm not put, uh, putting that much forward. Whereas more professional, uh, prolific authors are putting stuff forward constantly, so they have a way higher chance of, of getting rejection. I'm not saying that's because I'm better. It's just like a it's just a logistics thing. Uh, and also, I just tend to tell stories that I think. Uh, they, they're gonna they're gonna want or they'll be cool with me telling um and that's that's very hard to predict don't get me wrong so the key thing is to do is literally follow the submission guidelines and that sounds like nothing <laughs> and I, but i promise you it's everything because there are so many people who submit 
like, actually, I'm going to blow them away by writing about X instead of Y. They're asking for Y for a reason. Okay, like they're not they're not pissing around. They're not uh, they're not waiting for someone who's just clever enough to buck the system. You know, like sometimes, like when you color outside the lines, you just you make you make a mess. So, you know, that that's the best thing. Like if you if you follow the submission guidelines, that inc that increases your chances of acceptance tenfold. And in terms of rejection, you, you, it, you just can't let it get to you. You, you just can't mm. let it get to you. That's that's it's um it's it's so bland and banal to say, but it's just it's the only truth, really. You just can't let it get to you. Everyone comes up against it at some point. And, and it's probably not to say that, and it's not like it's a no, never. Like no, you suck. Don't ever. You no, know, I, I don't imagine Black Library has ever said to anyone, "You suck so bad, you should quit writing and go do something else." Yeah. Uh, it's it's not a no. It's a it's just a not now. And yeah, maybe your yeah. story needs to be refined. Maybe you need to flesh out your characters more. Maybe, as you said, it's just the wrong setting at the wrong time. And maybe next year, when there's a focus on the orcs, uh, the Gazgul book would be awesome. But right now, uh, that time has passed and that window's passed, not quite what we're looking for. And I think you're right as well. We we try to prove that we're smart. You know, we're we're the smartest person in the room. Yeah. And we do we take risks and uh, we do things like oh, I'll sneakily do this. I know they said this, but I'm going to try something else. And you can often be your own enemy. So I think it's I think it's I, again I approach job interviews the same way. Mm -hmm. I work backwards. What is the mm -hmm. ideal candidate? What are they looking for? What have they told me about the role? Whether it's experience or whether it is uh, knowledge, whether like what is it that they're looking for? And if I break down the the traits and the themes i can then work backwards to go right well what's the story that i want to tell and um and yeah maybe i'm not going to pick magnus but i'm going to pick um you know uh, a gaunt summoner and i'm going to tell the story of one of the nine gaunt summoners of zench and their relationship or how that works with the the thousand sons or um like what is it what is zench what's what's zench think about teclas's rise to power now and having to fight the Lumineth. And uh, don't do it from Zench, don't do it from from Kairos, do it from um, the Herald. Give me, give me, and then I, I can tell a story, I can build a story about a Gaunt Summoner and maybe a conflict between Gaunt Summoner A to Gaunt Summoner B. Um, I imagine that would be important. Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Maybe I should be a writer. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll be a pitch man. I'll happily go into games <laughs> workshop and just, just do it. It's easy. I'm the, I'm the hype man. Like you, I just need someone to write and I'll be the hype man. Like guys get the best story in the world. I want to sit you in a time where this is going to happen. And imagine you're sitting there and blah, blah, blah. that's me. That's why I would be a lawyer in America, but not in Australia. Is there any stories that you'd like to tell in the future? Obviously not breaking any NDAs, not talking about things you're currently writing on, but put yourself in a world three to five years from now when you're not writing those books and whether it's Sigma, whether it's 40K, whether it's Old World, whether it's something like Necromunda, is there a is this, there a story or a set of stories or a thing that you would love to tell um, if the opportunity was, was, um, was there? Okay. Um... This is a difficult question because again, and bonus points it's a, if it's a love story that we talked about right at the start. <laughs> I, I want to put you on the hook for a love story. Yeah, no, that would be cool. Um, no, I, yeah, I don't want to say anything that I might actually end up you know, going to Meta saying, "Hey, I want to do this." Um, I've got kind of a weird idea for an, an, a novel about knights, as in imperial knights in 40k, where um, it's every chapter is a different generation of a, a different knight who inherits that uh suit you know that that knight you know uh so a different scion inherits it and like over over the generations that knight starts to develop its own personality and its own scars and its own and you know you've got different pilots of you know, all who are all completely different people down the generations and you'd follow the course of like that night world so it would start off at the heresy and then you know what would that then you'd have a generation in the scouring and then you have a generation in maybe the nova terra interregnum or you know all that kind of thing and maybe the last one you know they would be fighting the tyranids or something or you know, that kind of thing i just like the idea of like this generational story where every every chapter is um 
uh, like, yeah, a, di a different generation. But the, the one I always say and is always is, is unfailingly true is, is Bad Apple. Like, I want to I want to tell the Bad Apple. But I, 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 would want, I want to tell it in a certain way. And it wouldn't be like that we've told the heresy exactly. Um, do you have any? Do you have any um, aspirations on telling stories uh, from a, a Xenos or an Eldari or a, um, even like any type of like I guess not wouldn't say chaos, but certainly a non-human. Uh, I know. I know you talked about dwarves and Duarden, um in the past, but uh, do you have a? Do you have an interest or? I, I don't even know how you tell a story from a. From an Eldari point of view, or uh, from a, a, a Tyranid, a Tyranid view, um, for the animation stuff, the Hammer and Bolter animations that are coming out at some point, I, I did an Eldari story in that. Um, they've already shown like loads of screenies, so this, this isn't a spoiler. Uh, with the striking scorpions like running and like that, yeah, that's mine. And I'm, I'm, I, I have no idea how well it's going to go down, but it's it's one of the favorite things I've ever written, and I, I love it to bits. Um, yeah, but I, 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 we talked about this with Malarian, right? But I would really like to write about a culture in the realm of shadows, um, and like, or like a really reclusive Ideneth enclave, uh, where like all these other forces have discovered there's a realm gate, like at this mm. point, and that. But to them, like to, to all these invading forces, like oh, cool, a realm gate that you know, or a wellway rather, that's going to be super useful. But to the Ideneth, it's like the thing that's in the middle of their city. So you've got this this massive, massive siege where they have to defend their enclave. And they've hidden for so long and they have no allies and they're completely alone. So then they have to think, okay, do we reach out to other people? Like do we do we make allies? Do we make overtures to the Stormcast Eternals? You know, that kind of thing. I love like the kind of the politics of extinction. You know, like do we where, do we send you... do we send daddy a uh, Father's Day gift or at least a card? <laughs> I uh, know we've got some daddy issues with Teclas. Like, do we do we mend? Do we send him a carton of beer and hope he can help? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Like that would be that would be a really cool story to tell. I think so. Yeah, that would count as my elf story. Final question, uh, and I know I'm going to get shut down really quickly on this one. When will we learn the fate of Sevatar? I have a real answer to this, actually. Oh, I was expecting you to say no comment. No, um, I uh, his his fate is very well mapped out because I mapped it out with Alan Bly before he selfishly died. Uh, so I know exactly what Sevatar is going to do, um, and I have and I, I have like the name of the book in my head, and I know, you know, I, I know what story it would be, and. Yeah, I, I, unless I um, unless I suddenly die, which in these COVID times you never know. Uh, you know, maybe maybe a few years. I think. Well, well, yeah, I, I intend to tell it because I think it's worth telling. I think the fandom would absolutely be fanatical. I know. Uh, I, th I think I saw this question on. Uh, on Reddit, I saw this question when I asked some of my friends. Uh, this question kind of came up in some form or another around Sevatar. So uh, very, very popular. But ADB, this has been an awesome three hours of discussion. I could keep talking to you, but I know it's late. Um, and it's I do night. appreciate it is midnight. Um, it's only tw it's only 11 p.m. a.m. for me. So I've got an Australian day barbecue to go hang out with. Um, but if people people want to know more um you know i've got your twitter handle down below definitely go follow uh i've got some of your websites so i've got your uh, black library um catalog below as well as your web comic um is it fate of jove something of jove, uh, to jove. that one that one so i was checking that out that was pretty sweet um wonderful person to follow on twitter um highly recommend it but is there any shout outs anything you want to say kind of bring us home i know it's been three hours of 24 karat gold that you have spit out around storytelling character creation working at black library um hints tips and tricks on being a professional author you've you've told us all everything that um um i do have something that if uh if anyone wants to like buzz me on twitter with any hints that helps with their hobby motivation i would i would really appreciate that like and i, I mean genuinely I, like it's an actual 
actual guidelines and help to do better with my hobby, I would I would sincerely appreciate that because I'm so slow and motivation is so hard to come by. So yeah, I'll send you oh, uh, the. Thanks for I'll, send you the Rocky, I'll send you the Rocky soundtrack. Like nothing gets me pumped. Up. <laughs> Uh, no, no, please, please. I think uh, I think the least we could do, folks, is get onto Twitter, uh, give ADB a follow if you're not already following, and give some advice that you're finding, especially in a time that you know motivation might be lacking yeah, or you've right. got conflicting priorities. Um, you know, and hey, the faster that ADB is, the faster we get to get more books, which ultimately is a win for everybody. So, any hints, tips, or tricks? Um, I think it's the least we can do. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring up some of your photos. I love this stuff. Like you just like the quality <laughs> is just like superior. And um, you know, checking out your webcomic as well. This is obviously not your you know, road to Joe, but you know, some of the contributions. And uh, I'll just leave you here with this amazing final. <laughs> Why would you do this to me? <laughs> because it is Australia Day, and nothing says Australia like an Akubra. But ADB, thank you so much for your time. Everyone who right. hung out, thank you very much for your questions. Apologies if I couldn't get to all your questions. We will be here for ten years, um, but. Luckily, we have a, uh, you know, check out his Goonhammer article. Go check out Vodka, uh, Voxcast. There was a, an interview with Wade uh, about 12 months ago um, if you want to learn more about ADB. But thank you very much for your time. This was awesome. I learned so much. Totally welcome, man. Thank you for having me. See you, guys. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with the link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.